Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Whew. Hoping for the best today, because uh, we're having some rain, some heavy rain, as a matter of fact. Uh, David Cage, do not come here. Um, so let's all hope together. Let's join our hands together and hope that nothing, uh, nothing happens. Heartwolf, thank you for the five dollars. It was a red truth last time that you needed money, so here's some money. Thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, so our task today is to finish episode two. Uh, sight. Citrine Ray. Yeah, Citrine Ray. Ray. Welcome. Thank you for becoming a channel member. Um, I would also like to take a moment. Uh, obviously, everybody has been talking about it, but I would like to take uh, a moment to, um, you know, give a, give a moment of silence for uh, Kira Toriyama, legendary creator. So sad to see him go, but very thankful for all of his work. Uh, same goes for uh, Tarako, who also uh, was the voice actress who played Monokuma in Danganronpa 3, the anime, and Danganronpa V3. Uh, passed away today as well. Um, so, you know, big respects. Rest in peace. Thank you for all of your work. Just gonna give that a second while I look at something real quick. <clears throat> All right, uh, and now that we've done that, let's uh, get right into it. Uh, June pop with the five dollars. Ah, uh, yeah, me too. Iconic laser with the five dollars. R.I.P. All due respects. Absolutely. Um. Also, yeah, Cthulhu. I see you with the Signalis profile picture. I should stream Signalis one day. Maybe. I love Signalis a whole whole lot. I'm very normal about it. Um, but anywho, uh, let's get on with it. Let's finish episode two. After Gen Genji finished taking his late meal, he went out to do the nighttime rounds inside the mansion. He reheated the soup that Gota had started making and ate some random leftovers from the refrigerator. <laughs> Cthulhu Elster with the Canadian $2. Please do. Funny Sabet. <laughs> Sesbian Androids. <laughs> I, I understood your intention. They were all things Gota had made himself and were, of course, delicious. He had half-heartedly gone to ask Rosa and the others what they would do for dinner, but he had been yelled at by a voice telling him that they had canned food, so they were fine, and the door wasn't even opened for him. So, ironically, it was the servant, Genji, who was able to eat the more delicious meal. But even though all of those crimes had been committed, and many people had already met a brutal end, why was it that Genji wasn't afraid to do the rounds all by himself? Historian Sayori, what is Signalis, just to ask? Uh, Signalis is a recently released uh, horror, like, survival horror game uh, about androids and uh, the lesbianism. It's, it's got a lot of Silent Hill and Resident Evil influences. It's very early PS1-esque. Um, give it a shot. It's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. Judging by his appearance, as he carried out his normal tasks without a trace of fear, as though everything was normal, you might think that all of the horrible events that had happened today were just a dream or an illusion. Was he talking, taking a philosophic view, or was it simply resignation? Genji must have considered it a virtue to systematically carry out his duty until the last moment, since the fate that awaited him was unavoidable. It would probably be eternally impossible to perceive the depths of his heart unless he told of it himself. Because he had given the master key back to Rosa, the places he could go were extremely limited. All he could do was walk around the hallways, checking to make sure that the windows were closed. So he was able to go around that route far more quickly than usual. Hmm. A 
After the sound of a moderate knock, Auntie Rosa, oh, okay, this is back to Battler, I suppose. Auntie Rosa, who had been falling into a doze shortly before, jumped and woke up, pointing the barrel of the gun at the door as she yelled. Who is it? I was napping on a sofa, and that voice also brought me back to reality. Rosa-sama, it is Genji. Do you have some business? We'll be fine without opening the door. Tell us from there. Yes. Well then, forgive me for speaking in, that fa in this fashion. I have found the bodies of Dr. Nanjo and Kumasawa. Wh what did you say? I see. All right, let's go and check them. Until I see the corpses, I won't believe anybody. <clears throat> oh, are we experiencing any technical difficulties? Hold on. Not having any problems here? Okay. Well, uh, yeah, let me know if uh, anything goes awry. <clears throat> oh, it's all right, Battler. If you're with me, it'll definitely be all right. Maybe my face was shadowed with anxiety. Maria grasped my hand with her small hand and spoke softly, trying to give me courage. Since it was Auntie Rosa's job to ready the gun and stand guard, it fell to me to remove the barricade of sofas. When I finished, I took a backward glance at Auntie Rosa, who was pointing the barrel of the gun over my shoulder and opened the door. Oh, I see, Daniel the Spaniel. I, I guess maybe it was just like a weird like loading issue on your end or something. Um, but yeah, we, we only just started anyway, so like nothing has really happened, so don't worry about it. <clears throat> Genji-san, where are their corpses? In the courtyard. I shall guide you. Batherkun, wait. Just in case, I'm going to check the doors and windows of this room before we go. Wait a second. Auntie Rosa called me to a halt to prevent me from going on ahead and began to carefully check the locks on each of the windows, but those locks had already been checked once. It felt kind of unpleasant, as though she suspected that I might have secretly unlocked them when she wasn't looking. No, maybe she was right to be cautious. Even though it was called a courtyard, it wasn't really a pretty place you could take a walk in like a rose garden. On the contrary, since it was surrounded by the mansion on all sides, it made you feel a little discomfort, as though it was telling you you couldn't escape from the mansion, even if you tried to escape to the outside. On the other hand, thanks to that, even though the violent winds could be heard, the wind itself was blocked. Genji-san held out an umbrella, but Auntie Rosa ignored him. She probably wanted to say that the gun took two hands, so, taking the umbrella would be dangerous because she wouldn't be able to fire the gun. Even without Genji-san pointing his finger, we could tell immediately. Right in the center of the courtyard, we could see where Dr. Nanjo and Kumasawa-san lay. Auntie Rosa entered the courtyard without even an umbrella, so Genji-san and I also entered the courtyard without opening one. Only Maria had one open like normal. Maria, is this... you know... Mm. It's the seventh twilight and eighth twilight. Nanjo Teramasa, his corpse which had gone missing, was later found in the courtyard. At that time, it was found with a weapon shaped like a stake having been rammed into the knee. That finishes up the seventh twilight. Kumasawa Chio, her corpse which had gone missing, was later found in the courtyard. At that time, it was found with a weapon shaped like a stake having been rammed into the ankle. That finishes up the eighth twilight as well. I... I see. Certainly. Just as Genji-san and the others said, there are horrible wounds on their necks. Very sharp. Almost as though they'd been sliced with a katana or something. That gaping wound on their necks definitely made me want to avert my eyes. But after seeing the Halloween party in the chapel, even though I thought it was horrible, it was no longer enough to make me feel sick. Instead, our gazes were directed to their legs, in Dr. Nanjo's knee, in Kumasawa-san's ankle. Driven into each of them was something like a knife or a stake with a demonic decoration. They would surely be the same as the one that had pierced Jessica's back. What is this? It's the same as Jessica-chan. Is this supposed to be some kind of occult ritual, I wonder? I do not know. 
The last time I saw their bodies, there was nothing like this. Maybe it was done after they were carried out of the servant room. The one that had been struck into, stuck in doc, into Dr. Nanjo's knee was still standing erect, but the one that had been thrust into Kumasawa-san's ankle might have been a little shallower. It had come out and fallen over. So it was only when I saw that one that had fallen over that for the first time I realized that it wasn't a knife, but something like a stake. Its full length was probably about 30 centimeters. It was probably made out of bronze or iron or something of the sort. Even without touching it, I could tell it had some weight to it. It was composed of a grip and a cone-shaped part, and it was obviously made to be a piercing weapon. Maybe you could describe it like a miniature version of those lances Western knights used on horseback. The grooves that had been carved in a spiral shape made it also look like a drill. However, the grip had an occult-like design of a demon or something. So, instead of a weapon used in war, it felt like something that would be used in a ritual to offer up a sacrifice. There's no mistake. They're meant to be... sacrifices. On the seventh twilight, gouge the knee and kill. On the eighth twilight, gouge the leg and kill. Wait. Then they've left out the fourth, fifth, and sixth twilights. D don't tell me. That's right. Why is genji son alone? If something like this had happened, why wouldn't George Aniki, Goda-san, or Shannon-chan be here? Why was genji son alone? What is this? Where did George-kun and the other two go? They told me they wanted to go to Madame Natsui's room to search for something, and left. They've not returned yet. What did you say? Uh, you say they left? Uh, when was that? Two or three hours ago, I believe. No, no way! Why didn't you say something that important- uh, Wait, no. Uh, why didn't you think that was suspicious? There must always be one servant awaiting orders. It was my duty to wait for orders until they returned. Was genji sound really this much of a robot? This is bad. This is bad. It's really bad. The fact that Dr. Nanjo and Kumasawa-san had been killed in this way meant that three people had already been killed. We ran towards Aunt Natsumi's room with a touch of anxiety and just as much resignation. Before we even saw the inside of Aunt Natsuhi's room, we were imprisoned by a certain resignation. On that door was bizarre graffiti. No, filth? In any case, the door wasn't in a normal state, and we were able to imagine what was inside that room without opening it. On the face of the door, how should I say it? Someone had heavily painted their hands with the same red paint that the magic circles from before had been drawn with, and had banged on the door, scratched it, dirtied it. It was dirtied like the aftermath of a kindergartner playing in the mud. I didn't know what it could mean. The bright red paint that had been slathered on was dripping down, and even though no one said it, it made us think of blood. genji sana please open it. Auntie Rosa held her gun up high and ordered Genji-san to open it. Genji-san approached the door without being particularly troubled by that stuff on it and turned the knob. But he immediately turned around, shaking his head. It was locked. Right now, there was only one person in the mansion who could lock and unlock doors at will, Auntie Rosa. This time, Genji-san asked Auntie Rosa to unlock the door instead of the other way around. After making a slightly disgruntled face, Auntie Rosa handed me a master key and told me to open the door. Batherkin, would you open it for me with this? Just trusting Genji-san with something like that wouldn't... Auntie Rosa glared at me with an intense gaze. Getting into a fight here would only make the environment turn even more sour. Without ta talking back anymore, I approached that creepy door and tried the knob. It didn't open. It was definitely the resistance of the lock. I stuck the master key into the keyhole. Clunk. A light resistance. While listening to Auntie Rosa as she told me to be cautious, I opened the door without being particularly cautious at all. And there is the scene laid out before us, not betraying our expectations in the slightest. <laughs> How horrible. Mm. As I thought. It was a reproduction of the 4th, 5th, and 6th Twilight. Ahem. 
Ushiro Mia George died in Natsuhi's room with his stomach having been pierced by a weapon shaped like a stake. On the sixth twilight, gouge the stomach and kill. It's hard to say, but they might have been the second twilight. Uh, next is... Yep, Shannon. Died in Natsuhi's room with her forehead having been pierced by a weapon shaped like a stake. On the fourth twilight, gouge the head and kill. She got to spend her last moments with the man she loved. And finally, Gota. Gota Toshiro. Died in Natsuhi's room with his chest having been pierced by a weapon shaped like a stake. On the fifth twilight, gouge the chest and kill. The chef's goose was cooked. Kihihihihihi. <laughs> The inside of the room looked as though a robber had just broken in. Drawers were flung open, pulled out, with their contents thrown all over the floor. The rooms devastated so that it looked nothing like the room of the methodical Aunt Natsuhi. <laughs> Elster, I'm just curious, how are you feeling right now? I'm feeling okay. Uh, honestly, the stuff from, like, yesterday with uh, Toriyama is just... It really did kind of hit me unexpectedly hard. I mean, like, obviously it's very sad whenever a creator you like passes away, but like, I don't know. It's just, uh, it's kind of surreal. It doesn't feel real to me. It's, uh, it's a lot to take in. <clears throat> but the thing that caught the eye before that was Godasan's body lying face down right in front of the door. One of those demon stakes had been rammed right into the center of his chest almost as though it had been stuck there to finish off a vampire. Exactly how far would it have reached after being stuck that deeply into his chest? My own chest hurt just imagining it. <sighs> Gouge the chest was the fifth twilight. Mm. Maria grabbed my hand. Her expression looked just like normal, but maybe she really was afraid of the aura in this room where three bodies lay. And along the wall furthest into the room, George Aniki was dead. This time, one of those stakes had been rammed right into the center of his stomach. Gouging the stomach was the sixth twilight, I think. Shannon Chan's body was face down over the front of the dresser, lying in a sea of blood. In its horribly broken mirror, sprayed with blood, had she seen her final worldly expression? Because she was face down, I couldn't see her face, but I could imagine even without seeing it. Nearby, in the sea of blood she lay in, a demon stake had fallen. Only the fourth twilight was left gouge the head and kill. Maybe my heart was completely tired out and dead. Even though I knew what I was doing was wrong, I lifted her head and checked, and confirmed that my guess was right on the mark. There was a gaping hole in Shannon Chan's forehead, and her insides were dripping out. Not only that, you could even see inside her. After seeing that, I finally noticed that what I was doing was wrong. I immediately averted my eyes, but by now it was probably pointless. Hey, Batlerkun! We have to leave everything alone until the police come. What do you think you're doing, touching it? What will you do if our precious evidence from the crime scene gets disturbed? Auntie Rosa yelled furiously at me, and even yanked the back of my collar. I tottered limply and fell on my butt, and gazed dimly up at the ceiling. Maria. Hmm? Now even the eighth twilight is over. What was the ninth twilight again? On the ninth twilight, the witch revives, and none shall be left alive. I see. So now the golden witch Beatrice will be revived. But then, on the final tenth twilight... On the tenth twilight, the journey ends, and you shall reach the home of the gold. Very soon, the door to the golden land will be opened. Very soon. The witch revives, and none shall be left alive, you say. We're going to die? Or is that sacrificial ritual over now, and our journey will end, and we can make it to the Golden Land? <laughs> our journey? Yeah, right. We've spent the whole day trying to f find the culprit, racking our brains as we tried to break out of this situation. And we haven't gotten anywhere. It's like they say. Thinking stupid is no better than sleeping. That's right. We've spent the whole day burning ourselves up with hatred and paranoia. We said we could only trust dead people. And we came all this way here just to check out their dead faces. If we're like this, how 
Can you say we made it to the Golden Land? That's right. If nothing could be solved, it would have been much better if we had locked ourselves up the whole time without thinking at all. Grandfather was the wisest of us. He'd been shut up in his room since yesterday, without any contact with anyone. That would have been fine. Grandfather was the most correct. It'll be alright, Butler. If you're with me, it'll be alright. Witches are very fickle, and they're terrifying beings who maybe kill humans for fun sometimes. But if you're together with me, it'll definitely be alright. So don't be afraid. Thank you. Even if that's just to comfort me, it makes me happy. After Auntie Rosa finished investigating their deaths, she proclaimed that she would seal this room again. Chased the rest of us out, stole back the master key she had lent me, and locked the door again. It seemed that George Aniki had been holding the original key to Aunt Natsumi's room. She had also collected that. Wait a second. She had all of the master keys in her hand. And if the original key had been shut up inside that room... Wasn't this another locked room? So this is a fourth locked room? Now that we've been released from our suspicion of those three, we once again returned to the bleh, returned to the parlor. I don't have a clue what's going on anymore. If only the dead are safe, and everyone alive is a wolf, then all that's left is me, Auntie Rosa, Maria, and Genji-san. Only those, Grandfather, and the 19th person, the guest who I hadn't even sensed, Beatrice. Thirteen people had died, and six were left. With only six people, how would the wolves and sheep puzzle end? Even though the puzzle which had, the, had had 19 people in it had been reduced to a mere six, I couldn't find any answer. We returned to the parlor. I felt a little anxious that while we were gone, a creepy magic circle or something might have been drawn on the door to the parlor, but thankfully there was none. Thank you, Genji-san. This is far enough. Please rest for the day. Certainly. Then, if you will allow me to rest. H hey Auntie Rosa, are you saying that you'll leave Genji-san all alone in a situation like this? You're right. I do think it's very dangerous. But, in that case, why is he safe? After those three headed to Natsuhine-san's room, he was alone the whole time. And yet he's safe. It's the wolves and sheep puzzle. Why would an isolated sheep, a sheep in its weakest position, be safe? P probably because, uh, by coincidence, there weren't any wolves. Wrong. Because it wasn't a sheep. Are you saying that Genji-san's a wolf? He said that he was alone in the kitchen, but that's impossible to prove. The only ones who could have carried Dr. Nanjo and Kumasawa-san's corpses, and who could have killed George and the rest, were him and Beatrice, right? Wait! With that argument, anyone... Butler-sama, thank you for your concern. I believe that trust will not be won with a hundred excuses, but with a single, unending faithfulness. Even if I am not able to gain your trust, I wish to be faithful until the end. Genji-san. Then it's settled. If you're truly innocent, the police will prove that for us when they come tomorrow. So until then, we cannot remove you from suspicion. After your long years of service to the Yoshiramiya family, I find it truly painful to treat you so poorly. But please understand for tonight. Then, when tomorrow comes, please let me make up with you again. Genji-san gave his head a small shake. Whether today or tomorrow, I will continue to be a servant to the Yoshiramiya family. If you have any business, please say so at any time. Then, if you will excuse me. After hearing all that, there was nothing left to say. Genji-san bowed deeply and left down the hall. And we entered the room. Even though Auntie Rosa still held all of the master keys herself, she began another thorough check of the inside of the parlor. She opened the curtains and checked again to make sure the windows were locked. As I watched, how should I say it? I felt like it didn't really matter anymore. If I said anything unnecessary, it would turn into another fight. For a while, I gazed at her from the corridor, figured I had waited just about long enough, and entered the parlor behind her. 
If she can't trust anyone but the dead, she should just go, kill, go around killing everyone with the gun she's got in her hand. And then, in the end, she'll realize that she herself was the wolf. And then she can blast through the head of the final wolf and the curtain will close on this insane murder theater. As I thought that bitterly, I returned to the sofa where I had been encamped before, and rudely rested both of my feet on the table. Or was about to, when I found something there and stopped my feet. What is... this? Right there, almost as though it was addressed to me, was a western envelope. It was that envelope from before, with the seal of the one-winged eagle. And it was unopened. Wait, 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 wait! What is... this? When? Who? Put it in a place like this! I had been sitting here the whole time, until I went with everyone to check the corpses. And there hadn't been anything. And when I returned, it was... here. It's alright. There was no problem with the locks on the windows. This room is safe. I heard Rosa muttering that. Wait, 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 wait! Wait, 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 wait! We had made sure this room was safe when we exited it. We had checked that the windows were all perfectly locked. And we had locked it, come back, and the windows were still locked. Then, wait, who would put this letter here, and how? I opened the letter. Two pieces of stationery came out. The first page had a magic circle drawn on it, something like blood. If I asked Maria, she'd probably know what it meant. And there was writing on the other page. Are you making progress solving the riddle of the epitaph? Very, very soon you'll run flat out of time. The ninth twilight will start very soon. There was no mistake. It was a letter from Beatrice. Hmm? Battler, what is that? Uh, right. When I came here just now, it was placed here. What happened, Maria? Huh? Batlikin! That letter! W wait! Uh, it was just placed here! Why? Even though we properly checked to make sure this room was closed! Why? Why? Maria, come here. Auntie Rosa closed her eyes just a little, and after silently thinking something, told Maria to come. Maria obeyed her mother's words. As she did, something unbelievable happened. Auntie Rosa pointed the barrel of that gun at me. Batherkun, I've concluded that you are a wolf. W why When I came into the room just now, I saw that there was nothing at all on the table. And I know that Maria did not approach that table. It was for a short time. But the only one who approached the table and claimed to have found the letter is you. How can you... Wait, th th that's all screwed up! Why would I put something like this here? Wait, wait, I just found something suspicious and reported it, right? Why are you suspecting me? Because only you could have set that letter there. That's right. This is all a charade! You pulled an envelope from your pocket and then acted as though you had just found it to create the illusion that the witch entered a locked room, set down a letter, and left. You dumbass! Are you thinking like that uh, again? Abaddon with the gifted 10 memberships. Let's go. Thank you so much. Because of something like that, you're going to suspect me? Cut that out! My family has been killed! Why would I of all people take part in the culprit's scheme? Yes. Even under the assumption that you could receive a large amount of money, I don't want to believe a demon exists who would sell their own parents. But maybe he does. No, that's a bad way to say it. What if, in your eyes, Batakun, Rudolf Nissan, and Kyrie-san weren't your parents? Wh what? Think about what you're saying! Dad is Dad! Sure, I'm not related to Kyrie-san by blood, but she's like a big sister to me! Don't you dare say otherwise, you bastard! <coughs> Stop it! <coughs> Stop saying ooh! I'm sorry, that was a bad way to say it. Of course, Yoshiro Mia Batlerkun might be Rudolf Nissan's child. But, are you really Batlerkun, the son of Rudolf Nissan? What? What the hell are you talking about? If I'm not Batler, then who else do I look like? 
All of us, including Rudolf Nissan, reunited with you after a six-year gap. No one can prove that you really are a Shiromiya Battler, right? Maybe you weren't really a Shiromiya Battler, but someone who snuck in, trying to skillfully steal the wealth of the Shiromiya family! Can you clearly prove that you are a Shiromiya Battler? Right here, right now! Cut it out, damn it! I'm me! Ushiro Mia Battler! If we're gonna doubt even that much, are you really Ushiro Mia Rosa? I'm myself! No one else! Yeah, that's right. It's just as you say, the only one you can trust other than corpses is yourself! If you're gonna say that much, it's time I argued back! The door to Aunt Natsuhi's room, where George Aniki and the others died, was locked. George Aniki was holding the key to that room, right? And by now, the only one holding a master key is you! Weren't you the only one who could have locked that room? My reasoning goes like this. You're in contact with the real culprit. And while I wasn't looking, you lent them one of the five master keys. I wouldn't do that. See, there are five of them here, right? As if that matters. You could have set them in a prearranged spot and then collected it back. And weren't you the one who said it was suspicious whether there really are five master keys? So how are you saying that someone other than yourself set that letter there? As long as you can't prove that, you are a wolf. Shut up! Then why don't you show me some proof? How do you say the culprit killed George Aniki and the rest in that locked room? How did they lock it? Absolutely and totally correct. Natsuhi's room is exactly the same, just like usual. The door and the windows were locked from the inside. There were no frauds or tricks, no means of secret passage nor places in which to hide. Natsuhi's own key was in George's pocket and locked inside the room. That leaves only the five master keys and Rosa was holding all of them. And while I'm at it, the parlor is the same. The key to the parlor itself is sealed away in the servant room. So unlocking it with anything but a master key is impossible. The locked room definition of the room is the same as always. Come on, there's only one suspect now. How are you still playing dumb? Shiro me a battler. Shut up! You keep silent as well! You're the one who should keep silent. How dare you say the letter was set there by someone other than you? As long as you can't prove that, you are a wolf! If I can be suspected, then you can be suspected. You try showing me some proof. Weren't you the first to enter the room and begin checking the windows? Then you anticipated that I'd return to where I'd been sitting before and secretly place the letter. I can also suspect that this is your trap, can't I? Why would I use a trap like that? If I was a wolf, I'd shoot you with this gun without question. That's no reason! Maybe because you couldn't commit murder in front of Maria, you chose the roundabout way of setting a clever trap! All the master keys are in your hands! So this place and the room just a while ago are all you're doing, aren't they? If you can walk your way out, talk your way out of this, then let me hear your excuse! That's right. You've been suspicious from the start! Why is it that the six adults in the fam family conference were killed, and you were the only exception? Why were you the only one not in that chapel? There can only be one reason. You called Dad and the rest out there and killed them! Damn it. Damn it! That explains everything, doesn't it? Don't fuck with me! Don't fuck with me! Stop saying things that don't make sense! thrust herself in between me and Auntie Rosa, both of us incensed. I was taken aback by Maria's crying voice and returned to my senses. At that instant, I became filled with shame. Tears flowed from my eyes. <laughs> That's right. It's all the witch's fault, isn't it? All this about keys and tricks and alibis, all of it. All of it was stupid. Even though it's the work of the witch, we weren't able, we even able to trust each other as fellow humans. Right, Auntie Rosa? From the beginning, there wasn't a human culprit. It was all the work of the witch. So there's no way that you're the culprit. 
<laughs> There's no way I'm the culprit, or Maria, or Genji-san, or anyone! Why does it come to this? Why am I screaming with Auntie Rosa, who I loved? Why am I having this fight? With the kind aunt who I loved? Why? Why does everyone have to suspect each other? I'm not going to doubt my aunt. I'm not going to doubt anyone. It's all the work of the witch. It's all the work of Beatrice. It's all... All the crime that Beatrice committed with magic. Beatrice, please show yourself here. And confess to us that you did everything. I've had enough already. I've had enough of doubting each other like this. So forgive us. Release us. Release us from this hell of suspecting each other until we see each other's deaths. Give me my kind relatives and cousins back. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. You definitely exist. You win. Show yourself. Beatrice! Beatrice! <laughs> Am I still alive? Kinzo seemed to have fallen into a doze at some point. He searched for his spectacles and looked at the cloth. It was 10 p.m. A ritual. I wonder how far it has progressed. It must have progressed quite far by this time. Kinzo lifted his bu heavy body from the chair and approached the portrait of the witch that he had gazed at every day. Beatrice, very soon, I will be reunited with your smile. Yeah, sorry for the airplane noise. <laughs> it doesn't matter if I die. If I could just see your smile once more, I would gladly give this life of mine. So, I beg you, let me meet with you one more time. And let me swear my love to you. Let me apologize for my crimes. <laughs> but I won't let you escape. You are mine. From your hair to the tips of your toes, to the dirt under your nails, you are mine. Every fragment of your flesh is mine. Even the broth of your corpse is mine. I won't let you escape. This time you won't spill from my hands. I'll make you mine for all eternity. I will never let you escape a second time. I will never let you escape a second time! Kinzo howled in rage, then suddenly fell to his knees as he shook and scraped at the wall. In an, in an instant, he had started sobbing. <laughs> That's wrong. That's not what I wanted to say. Beatrice, please. Let me meet you one more time, even if you only let me apologize. <laughs> Beatrice! <laughs> you are beloved. Yearn for. I was wrong. If you would just smile, I wouldn't need anything else. I made a mistake. I got it wrong. I did something that cannot be taken back. An atonement I have offered the whole remainder of my life in order to apologize to you. In order to atone for my sins. I have offered everything. Please. Even if it is as I die. At least. Let me. Say one word. Of apology. <laughs> As Kinzo shook and cried, behind his small back, a butterfly appeared out of nowhere, like a flake of gold leaf, and softly fell down. You fool, Kinzo. 
Do you think a woman exists who would fall for a man's tears? Well, even if it wouldn't make a human woman fall for you, it might for a woman who is not human. Kinzo, do you remember the board position of our chess game, which we never finished? Kinzo, as though he had suddenly remembered something, approached the chess set. The game he had been playing with Nanjo until yesterday remained there still. He wiped the pieces from the chessboard with a wide sweeping motion and began to line them up again one by one. It was the setup for a game in progress. That's right. Like this. I advanced my queen. That was a very spectacular move. It might have been a little too intense for you. I deliberated whether you would throw away your piece or not. Deliberated. Deliberated. Kinzo waited, with the opposite seat empty. Surely, very soon, his opponent would appear there, and he would be able to restart this game again. You fool, Kinzo. You want to apologize? You want to see my face again? You want to make my smile an eternal thing? Why can't you say a much, much simpler word? even though that is the single element of the world. At that time, Kinzo muttered, a prayer, an entreaty. It was probably best to just call it muttering. I love you, Beatrice. They were pure words, like something an innocent child would say, without any evil intent. You really are a fool, Kinzo. If you ever have the chance to do your life over again, know that those words could never cause a woman to fall for you. Yes, not without a miracle. So this. Just then, Kinzo definitely heard a small knock with a different tempo than those of the servants. Who is it? The woman beyond the door didn't answer. I'm asking who you are! Will you not answer? The woman beyond the door didn't answer. Could it be? Could it be? Beatrice? Beatrice? Beatrice! The woman beyond the door answered. On the ninth twilight, the witch revives, and none shall be left alive. Battler could be found in the dining hall, unable to summon the will to return to the guest house in the middle of the rain. He had wandered half-heartedly around the mansion in search of a random place to sit, and had stationed himself in the dining hall. He hadn't bothered to lock it. He did think that maybe the shapeless murderer or the golden witch might come to kill him now that he was isolated, but he no longer thought about resisting that. On the contrary, he had no intention of blocking the culprit with a lock. He wanted that person to come at him openly from the front. If this if it was the mur if it was a murderer, he thought he'd ask them to tell them tell about some of those wonderful locked room tricks as a parting souvenir. And if it was a witch, he thought he'd ask her to at least take his life with some wonderful magic. However, ironically, neither of these two came to meet Battler. Battler opened the liquor cabinet on his own and enjoyed the liquor to his heart's content. No longer was there anybody anywhere who would have a problem with him drinking alcohol. He boldly set both of his legs on the extravagant tablecloth and savored the high-quality liquor, which probably had a mind-boggling price, straight from the neck of the bottle. At that time, someone knocked. Battler realized that he was about to meet his maker. Hey! It's not locked! Come in, whoever you are. And please, introduce yourself. If you're human, give me your name. And if you're Beatrice, give me your three sizes. You might not believe this, but I'm a pretty well-known breast sommelier, you see? <laughs> it is Genji, Battler Sama. <laughs> I'm sorry, just like him being like, 
tell me about your boobs. And then Genji just being like, <sighs> it's me. <laughs> it's... Oh, isn't it so sommelier? Sommelier? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. He's drunk, you know, he probably would get it wrong anyway, too. <laughs> Genji son, huh? Sorry, but I'm not interested in your bust size. Please, come in. It's open. Excuse me. Genji san opened the door and bowed. So, Genji san was the culprit after all, or maybe an accomplice? That theory would probably explain most of the tricks. Did you come to give me my last rites? Nothing of the sort. I shall excuse myself if I'm disturbing you. Wait, wait. Excusing yourself without even telling me what you wanted would actually just be creepy. What do you want? Please, let me do as I wish, at least in the very end. Butler Soma, is it truly your wish to spend the little time you have left in such an indolent fashion? Those words stung. Of course it wasn't. <sighs> what can I do at this point? I'm ready to I'm ready to die at any time. You're just like the master. Indeed, you inherited the master's blood strongly. You mean to tell me the grandfather, that larger-than-life man, was actually willing to die at any moment? First I've heard of that. The master's life, after a number of sad incidents, was completely reduced to atonement. What do you know? Oh, er, what do you know, rather. Not what do you know, what do you know? <clears throat> Beatrice-sama's ritual has been entirely completed up to the Eighth Twilight. I believe that I can now tell you everything. What, what did you say? My drunkenness was completely blown away. I lowered my feet from the table and listened carefully to hear what kind of words Genji-san would say next. Butler sama I shall guide you to the Master's study. It would probably be better to hear it directly from them. From... them? Hey, what in the world do you mean by that? Come, this way. I shall guide you, Butler sama after Genji-san told me to follow him, he started to walk down the corridor. I sobered up completely and went after him. We climbed the big staircase, towards the third floor. Genji-san stopped walking halfway. He then turned back and spoke. Battler sama from here on you will probably see things you will not be able to understand. Don't try to intimidate me. I've already seen plenty of things I can't understand today. Please accept what you see as you see it, and what you hear as you hear it. Questions, li oh, questions like why or what. There's no need for such things. Battler Sama, you will probably simply learn the truth, whether to accept it, believe it, or even deny it, are all choices I leave to you. Hmm. Genji-san checked one last time to see whether I was prepared to learn the truth. The Eighth Twilight had already ended, and on the Ninth Twilight, the Witch revives, and none shall be left alive. It meant that Beatrice had already revived, and probably none of us would be allowed to return alive. If I was going to lose my life anyway, I wanted to know the truth in the end. It didn't matter how hard it might be to accept. Yeah. Even if a de demon or a witch shows up, I'm prepared. You really are just like the master in his youth. Butler Summer, please be diligent in your studies. In the future, you will surely have great aspirations. And make sure that at that time, you are not forced into a lifetime of regret by a lack of academic knowledge. If I have a chance to work hard in my studies, then no problem. Genji-san's silence forced me to consider that resignation of mine more deeply.
And we could smell the door of Grandfather's study, impregnated with the sweet smell. From his pocket, Genji-san withdrew a gold key with an elegant design. The master's keys had been the master keys had been confiscated by Auntie Rosa, but the key to this study alone he had kept with him. He put it in the keyhole, and it made a heavy clunking sound. My lord, it is Genji. I have brought Battler Sama with me. There was no reply, but it seemed that permission to go in had been given. Come, Battler Sama. Please enter. Yeah. In I go. I readied myself and threw the door open. At that moment, I got slightly disoriented by the dazzling golden glow. It was somehow a swarm of butterflies, shining gold. The golden butterflies that were completely filling the inside of the study poured out all at once. What, what the heck is this? It was almost like a golden leaf confetti. The interior on Grandfather's study was filled with a golden glow. And there were, and there were receptions, uh, reception sofas and a table for guests placed in front of the study desk. And I could see Grandfather's back. There was someone on the side opposite from Grandfather. It was in shadow, so I couldn't see it well. My lord, I have brought Battler somewhere. Battler, is it? I'm busy thinking now. Be silent for a while. Kinzo declared that in displeasure, his back still turned. It seemed that he was enjoying playing chess with a visitor. Apparently, the opponent had counterattacked with a superb move. Kinzo seemed to be enjoying himself as he thought deeply, while occasionally laughing and groaning. I thought for thirty years. I thought for thirty years about how to counterattack this move. Have fun, have fun with the move I fermented for thirty years. <laughs> Indeed, this is a deeply matured move. Such fun, such fun! <laughs> unbeatable, unbeatable! What, what is this? So you came, Battler. Wait just a moment. Be silent for Kinzo's sake. Isn't it too early to resign, Kinzo? I can already counterattack for several moves. <laughs> It should have been my first meeting with that witch. However, I knew this witch. Even though it was our first meeting, I knew her from the portrait. Genji, serve something for Battler. What would be the most appropriate for this man? The same which the Master has loved since the days of his youth. That is ideal. Serve it to him. You did well coming here, Ushiro Mia Battler. First, take a seat. You called my name many times, did you not? In deference to that, I allowed you to meet me. So, what will you ask me? What will you inquire? The door to the Golden Land will soon be opened. Soon we will have a banquet to celebrate my revival, for which I will be welcoming the witches. In the meantime, I'll be answering your questions, as many as you like. Uh, I have a bunch of things I want to ask about. What happened on this island? And why did these incidents happen? I want to ask about the locked rooms, too. What about the chapel? What about Jessica's room? And the servant room? And Aunt Natsuhi's room? And the parlor? There's more that I still want to ask about. About the witch's true nature. Are you really a witch? What's your purpose? What do you make us... What do you want to make us do? And why did you call me here? Answer me about everything! Uh, be quiet! You think merely asking will get you answers? Don't say that, Kinzo. A fragile and fleeting spiderweb did protect the King Herod once. Just as there are no useless things in this world, there are also no useless questions. Very well, I'll answer all your questions. But I do have one condition. What is it? Once you've heard everything, if you are satisfied of my existence, kneel and kiss my shoes. I called you here because I wanted to make you submit to me. Kinzo and I made a bet. We bet on which would come first. Kinzo thinking of a new move or me forcing you to submit. I don't see myself losing. 
<laughs> Damn you, talking so tough! Oh, yeah, alright. Try to make me admit it. Try to make me admit you're a witch and that you can use weird, awesome, and great magic. If I submit, I'll kiss your shoes or do whatever else you want. The witch cackled gloatingly. Then she glared at him with unpleasant glared at him unpleasantly, with eyes that said a man can't go back on his word. Well said. So from what question shall I begin? I'll answer everything. Come, what will the first one be? And the witch began to tell of everything. She started providing answers to all of Battler's questions. Everyone made logical sense. Everyone satisfied him. And Battler was forced to admit, witches truly did exist. The rest is a story that need not be told. After toppling the king and resigning, all that remains is to reflect upon one's moves and set the pieces up once more. Second game, Turn of the Golden Witch, result. Don't worry, there is a pretty lengthy after credits and there are the two tea parties we have to get to as well, so there's still quite a bit left. But go ahead, gaze upon the, uh, the roster of people who died. Yeah, we're 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 still going. Don't worry. We still we got we still got some stuff to get to. It's quote unquote the end, but it's not really the end quite yet. Shirami Akinzo, missing on the tenth twilight, accepted the witch, prostrated himself, and was invited to the Golden Land. Rosa denied the existence of the witch and was not invited to the Golden Land. <laughs> Everybody else uh, accepted the witch, and Battler, missing on the 10th twilight, will he accept the witch and be invited to the Golden Land? The witch shall praise the wise and grant four treasures in the Golden Land. There they chose to revive the souls of the dead and the love they possessed, because what they desired could not be gained from a mountain of gold no matter how high. For Kinzo, his lost loved one. For Maria, the lost love of her mother. For Genji, a peaceful sleep. Rest in peace, Beatrice. May your slumber never be disturbed again. Iconic laser for the $10 in honor of her victory today. There's still plenty more, chat. That's true. The winner is the Golden Witch Beatrice. Since of the 18, none solved the riddle of the golden time, all 18 died. When the seagulls cried, none were left alive. Aster with the five dollars gonna pop back out for a bit because I don't want to spoil myself, but thank you so much for doing these streams. I look forward to each one of them. Hey, thank you so much for staying around and thanks for the donation. I hope you enjoy the rest of this episode when you get to it. Ahem. <clears throat> Where are you, Beatrice? Show yourself! Beatrice! Rosa finally arrived at the chapel. She pointed her gun around her, screaming the witch's name, but there was no way that there would be an answer. After grimacing slightly, she noisily approached the table where her siblings' corpses were still exposed and stretched out her arm toward the gold ingots. They were heavy, they were very heavy, but Rosa paid that no regard. She wrapped one of them up in a blanket and slung it over her shoulder. At least, just this one. Just this should be worth more than 10 million. Rosa did not part with her gun either, carrying the gold in addition to it. Her shoulders were screaming, but Rosa didn't care. <laughs> it will happen very soon. Very soon, the door to the Golden Land will open. Stop laughing with that creepy voice. Where is Beatrice? Yes, I know it. She's around here somewhere, isn't she? You know, right? Where? <laughs> I don't know. 
Even if you don't search for her, you can meet her in the Golden Land. <laughs> Ouch! Stop that laugh! Gah, it, all makes, it almost makes me want to laugh. That's right, that was definitely a witch. Definitely a witch! I didn't understand. I thought it was a human calling herself a witch. I was wrong. It really was a witch. I won't be fooled by a thing like that. You're there, aren't you? Come out! Show yourself! Beatrice! <clears throat> I told you, she'll appear very soon. The door to the Golden Land will be opened. <laughs> Of course. That's what I should have done. I don't care. I shall throw away the rook. You, woman, are the king, who can't even be reached with the resolve to lose everything one has. I c I'll corner you, Beatrice! <laughs> At least call me a queen. Oh, what a brilliant move. Tenacity is in your, no, in the Ushiramiya's blood. How pleasant. Truly an elegant knight. <laughs> My lord, Beatrice Summer, it will soon be time for the banquet. Already? That's fast. Every night I pass with you goes by fast. The moon falls like an apple, and the sun rises like a small fish leaping out of the river. Shall we go? It is time. Stand, Battler. It is the beginning of the banquet to celebrate my revival. I'll introduce you as my new furniture. No, as my toy to the dignitaries among witches. The witch was relaxing elegantly, her feet thrown out from the sofa and sitting on top of a footrest. However, the footrest wasn't a part of the sofa. It was a human, which was down on all fours. Beatrice Sama, your silk dress. You are the guest of honor, but I am the host. I will go out first. It would have been nice if Shannon were here to help dress you, but unfortunately it seems she no longer remains. She's never around when I want to use her. Completely useless. However, you did well to remain here. I'm happy, my friend. I'm grateful for your words. Good. Wait downstairs, you two. Genji, good work. Set the dress down over there. Certainly. Well then, my lord. We will go first. Beatrice, I will see you later. Indeed. Kin Kinzo and Genji left the study. After that, only the witch and the dress and the furniture remained. Do you know why I am not embarrassed to show myself to you naked? It's because you're furniture. Furniture. Understand? Furniture. Just furniture. Who would feel shame at exposing their body to furniture? So there is no reason for me to feel shame because of you. <laughs> the witch stood up and removed her jacket just at the shoulders. The jacket slumped down at the back. When the furniture respectfully approached to pick up her clothing, the witch gave it a small kick and it fell over. The furniture was afraid of what misconduct it had shown. Do you, as furniture, plan to force me to unbutton myself? Stand and undo the buttons, one by one, carefully, quickly, beautifully, with no mistakes. The guests are being kept waiting. Change my clothes quickly. Yes. <laughs> undo them carefully. Those buttons are worth, each worth, more, each worth more than one of your eyeballs. If you accidentally tear one off, I'll sew an eyeball of yours in its place. <laughs> the entrance hall was bustling with a large number of figures and it was sparkling gold with the gold butterflies flying around. The gentlemen in suits and tuxedos and the ladies in dresses looked like they were having a great number of friendly chats. At a glance, it might have looked like a fabulous medieval ball. 
But they all had one thing in common, and that thing was exceedingly bizarre. Because all of them had goat heads. It was impossible to tell whether it was a goat mask masquerade, or whether they really had goat heads. The latter was a ridiculous notion, but in this bizarre world, there was serious doubt about which was true. Kinzo was amongst those goat nobles, greeting them. Every one of them seemed to be an honored guest, and Kinzo greeted them more respectfully than could ever have been imagined from his normal demeanor. At that time, Genji's voice rang out through the hall. It was a voice calling for silence. That voice stopping for the voices of idle chatter, and everyone turned to face Genji. Tonight marks the entrance of our Golden Witch, who has achieved her revival, the Lady Beatrice. I ask you all join me in welcoming her with your applause. When Genji began to applaud, it, was qu it quickly spread through the guests and became thunderous applause. And the Golden Witch appeared at the top of the large staircase. She gracefully waved her hand as she slowly descended the staircase, with her preferred furniture in tow. The goat nobles offered unanimous words of celebration in some long-forgotten language. And with those whom she was closely acquainted and those with whom she was closely acquainted embraced her, filled with joy at their reunion. As the witch offered greetings of reunion, the witch's furniture followed behind her the whole time. There was a chain around its neck. This was gripped in the witch's hand, like it was a trained dog. The chain wasn't there to restrain it. The only purpose of the restraining device was to injure the furniture's dignity. It wasn't permitted to wear anything else on its body. One of the one of the young woman goats mixed in with the goat nobles, softly removed her goat mask as the furniture passed in front of her and spoke with eyes that had no light in them. That face looked like it belonged to a long-haired young girl. How pitiful. Oh, Lady Bernkastel, welcome. Do you like my furniture? Good taste. After saying only that, the witch called Bernkastel once again put on her goat mask and was swallowed up in the shadows of the other tall goats. <laughs> Sore loser. She's irritated. You're right. <laughs> the young woman, women goats giggled, and the witch once again let out a high-pitched laugh. Thank you for gathering here for my sake tonight. Why don't we enjoy to the fullest this banquet of the witch, where old friends have gathered from past, present, east, and west. Come, we will eat all night, drink all night, slurp all night, and chew to bits all night as we enjoy ourselves. Look at the clock. It shows the time when the ending hour and the beginning hour melt together. Come, let us begin the banquet of the witch. When the witch proclaimed the beginning of the banquet, the large clock pointed to midnight, and the sound of a bell began to ring out loudly. Come, now is the time. Open the golden door. All at once, the butterflies leafed in gold flew all around the inside of the room. Amidst the golden storm and the brilliant gold-colored light, the cross-section joining this world and a different world was cut open. Amidst the goats' delighted voices, the mansion of the human world and the mansion of those not human overlapped. And, in the form of golden butterflies, all those folk who praised the resurrection of the Golden Witch poured out of the depths of hell. It was a golden tornado. A rondo of golden demons. Come, tonight we will put aside rank. Throw open the wine cellar, drop the snake's head into the liquor pot, throw cows and chickens into the furnace alive, drink and eat and sing and dance, sneer and kill and desecrate and degrade. <gasps> Beatrice, take me to the golden land now! To the golden land! Oh! Ah! The goat nobles were suddenly crushing in around Kinzo, almost like they were kids demanding the autograph of some famous movie star. There were two differences. First, they were witches, not kids. And second, what the witches demanded were not autographs. Kinzo began to drown in the sea of goat nobles. Only Kinzo's laughing voice echoed throughout the area.
It was a grand mixture of laughter in his death throes, and Kinzo became wine and meat and bread, an aroma if slurped, a rich taste if gnawed, and pleasant to tear to bits. The voice of his death throes lingered on sweetly, and adorned with melted chocolate and silver dragaze? Dragaze? I assume it's dragaze because it has the little accent. <clears throat> it would make a wonderful dessert. If he took the bones home, you could also use them for soup. And the remains could even become toys for the children to play with. And they could also become good tools for fortune telling that always gave misfortune. That entire scene was watched by the piece of furniture. It was all fantastical. It was all demonic. Was the quaking of its heart, which should have been paralyzed, proof that it could still feel fear? Just then, its knees buckled, and the furniture's body tumbled onto the center of the carpet, because the witch hadn't kicked those knees from behind. Kneel and show your respect. Rub your forehead against the carpet and show how vulgar you are. Join your hands behind your back and swear that you will offer all of your flesh and blood to me. <laughs> the piece of furniture let out a painful voice. Fear is the most primal emotion humans have. Was that emotion reviving his sense of self, which should have already been killed? <laughs> so you're still far from being appropriate for my furniture. Good. I will carefully make you into the kind of furniture I like, the kind appropriate only for me. I suppose the best you can do for now is simply entertaining the guests. The goat nobles were surrounding the cowering furniture. It seemed that their blazing, blood-red eyes couldn't hide their ecstasy at this new young food they had been given. And from their mouths, from which protruded countless ugly teeth, saliva, or maybe the traces of meat and wine they had just eaten, dribbled down. <laughs> As the piece of furniture let out a wild scream, it retreated, still sitting on its backside. But the circle of goat nobles were closing in. And the piece of furniture looked at the witch's face. It stared at her face one final time, believing that because it had submitted to the witch, she would show it some mercy. But there was nothing but scorn on the witch's face, and she wasn't even facing it anymore. The witch went off to greet an honored guest with whom she had crossed gazes. The goat nobles looked down upon the furniture. They were, in fact, waiting. Just like how one must remove the cork in order to drink champagne. Before bringing the offering served at the banquet to their mouths, they were waiting for just one of those. Of course, the furniture didn't know what that was, but it would come out of his mouth all by itself. In the same way there is always a pop when the cork is removed, it too would certainly leave his mouth. <laughs> a scream. It was a sign that the modest banquet at which he was to be served had begun. <laughs> My man literally got fucking eaten by goats. Dude nut on so hard he got eaten. Whew. Okay, it's time for this. Let me take a breath. By now, the Rose Garden was a garden of roses and gold. A gold-colored garden where gold butterflies, gold fairies, gold lizards rampaged and flew about wildly. Maria, hurry! Run! Hurry, 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 hurry! Holding onto the gun and the blanket wrapping the ingot, Rosa ran at a speed Maria couldn't catch up with, sometimes pausing to call out at Maria to run faster. Therefore, she saw it every time. She saw the golden pursuers chasing them from the mansion. The mass of gold butterflies was chasing after them like a massive crawling hand, and horrifyingly strange-looking shadowy figures with goat heads were chasing after them. There was no need for her to strain her eyes, because those blazing peoples told her what would happen if she was captured. Mama, wait! Mama, wait! Mom. 
Uh. Maria tripped over. Rosa, ashamed that for just an instant she had entertained thoughts of abandoning her daughter and running away, kicked back against the ground and instantly reversed direction. Our Habaki Gaming, the $5. Hope you're okay after this heavy performance. Behold, the only Rosa W in the whole game still gives me chills. Yeah, absolutely. Same here. <clears throat> As Rosa's own child tried to stand, the goat, had, the goat head that had sprinted over to get the first bite grabbed a fistful of her hair and pulled her up from the back. Mama! No! Rosa rammed into the goat head with her shoulder, spun, bashed the back of her elbow into the goat's jaw, and buried her knee into its protruding chest. And she thrust the barrel of the gun inside the goat head's mouth as it doubled over from the pain in its gut. Just try laying one finger on Maria in front of me. I'll show you just how lukewarm the hell you came from is! The blast from the 45 caliber Long Colt bullet exploded inside the goat head's throat, and its medulla oblongata was instantly pulverized. The goat head couldn't understand. It had thought that women like were all, like already opened wine bottles. It had thought that they were wine bottles and that turning them upside down would immediately cause their deep red contents to come out. Mama! Mama! Released, Maria flung her arms around Rosa. But the pursuers were still coming. They could see the giant goat heads who had given up even pretending to be human, running towards them from across the rose bushes. Rosa spilled extra several, several extra bullets, which had been in the pocket of her coat, all over the place, and told Maria to pick them up. Y yes! Pick up, pick up! Maria, if Mama falls down, run. Go to the shore, and swim, and swim, and swim. There's no place on this island where we can survive. No, <laughs> together with Mama. Uh. Rosa's gun roared four times, but even though she really did land four shots in the chest of the massive approaching goat, it didn't even flinch. The goat ran with a violent vigor, as though it planned to crush Rosa and Maria with its massive body. Put the bullets in! Quickly! <laughs> Rosa grasped the blankets with the ingot in both hands, and she, she herself sprinted at the goat, dragging the ingot along behind her, without even an ounce of fear of that strange-looking giant. If it's to protect my daughter, I'll overcome even hell. I'll show you what a golden dream looks like! Rosa's roar. The goat head's roar. That terribly heavy ingot, after picking up a terrible centrifugal force and speed, slammed into the goat head's cranium. Rosa pulled a fountain pen from her pocket, but she held it crooked. She placed it in her palm, in the gap between her middle finger and her ring finger, so that it stuck out when she made a fist, almost like it was a stinger growing out. She jabbed that stinger into the left eye of the goat head as its head toppled forward. Was that goat head's roar a scream? But Rosa's roar was different. She pulled back her fist and slammed it into the fountain pen that was still sticking into the goat head's eye. The pointed tip was gouged destructively into the depths of its head. <coughs> Mama, bullets in! Good job! As I grabbed the gun that Maria had thrown, I finally heard the thunderous crash of the giant tumbling to earth. However, at the same time, I saw the goat head pursuers on the other side of the rose bushes increase in numbers. I've gained some distance, more than enough now. Holding onto the guns and the blanket wrapped around the ingot, I once again ran with Maria, holding onto the gun, one gun, rather. <clears throat> Why am I running with the gun in my right hand and the gold in my left? Why don't I free one hand and grasp Maria's hand? I can't let go of the gun that protects my body. I can't let go of the gold that protects my future. And yet I would let go of the hand of my daughter, who is my very future. Run, run, run. She got out of the rose garden and began to run down the staircase through the grove of trees. But Rosa knew this path through the grove was only turning and twisting many times to make it seem long. She tore straight through it. She had always played here when she was a kid, so she knew. To the beach, to the beach, to the sea, to the sea, to the sea. And after reaching the sea, 
Nothing to do but swim, swim, swim. If Maria can't swim, I'll carry her as I swim. There is nothing but death on this island. <laughs> Mama! As she raced down the stairs, she took a bad step. A violent pain ran up her left ankle and her mind went completely blank. Rosa fell down several stairs and stared in shock at her ankle, which was bent at an odd angle. And the blanket with the ingot wasn't there. She had let go of it the instant she fell and it had disappeared somewhere into the darkness. Only the gun was left. The tremors in the earth were getting closer. It was only a matter of time before the goat heads flooded in. She didn't want to imagine how many there would be or how strange they would look. The lightly dancing gold pursuers arrived. The gold butterflies surrounded Rosa and Maria, sparkling and clamoring as though saying, the prize is here, the prize is here. Rosa couldn't even try to get up. The violent pain from her broken ankle was so great that she couldn't ignore it, even in her last moments. What am I doing? I had the gold. It would have been worth several million yen. I might have been able to start over with that. And yet I fell, lost it. And that's not all, my own life is in danger. Even Maria's life is in danger. What has my life been? I was born in an incomprehensible house with an irritating older brother and sister since the day I was born. What did I do? No matter what I did or didn't do, I was always in trouble and bullied and made fun of. What has my life been? Mama, Mama, Mama! The roar inside Rosa's heart shriveled away and disappeared. It disappeared when she listened to Maria's crying voice as her daughter sobbed and clung onto her. Maria. Mama remembered that there's something she has left to do. Please go on ahead. No, 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 no! Want to be with Mama! Don't want Mama to die! Maria, even though I'm such a bad Mama, you still say you want to be with me? Yes! Want to be with Mama! Want to be with Mama! I made it look like I was putting you first. That I was always putting you off. I went to your sports day. I went to parents' day. And I was always thinking about how I appeared to the world. And you were never in my eyes. Are you saying that you want to be together? Even with that kind of Mama? Even though you've been such a bad Mama? Mama, did you know? There's only one mama in the world. There's no good mama or bad mama. There's just one mama. So all I want is for mama, the only mama in the world, to be here. And I want to become the only Maria for mama. The Maria who's in a good mood that you want to spoil. And the Maria who's a nuisance and you don't want to be around. We're different people. I'm also just one Maria. So the scary mama and the nice mama are just like that. To me, there is just one mama. I was such an idiot. I didn't need gold. If only I had just pulled your hand. I was such a stupid mama. The shadows of the goats covered the sky even more than the trees of the forest. Their roars blotted out the world with fear. Rosa, still hugging Maria, readied her gun with one hand. Maria, let's go together. Always together. So that Mama doesn't lose her way. Always together! Yes, can see each other soon. Always together. Can see each other in the Golden Land. And then we'll play together. Play with the wolves and sheep puzzle. You still haven't solved more than one question, Mama. And I solved them all. So I'll be the questioner. She had bought that as a birthday present. And then hadn't played with it. Played it with Maria after that night. Yes. Let's play. Together. I promise. Mama! Those eyes, sparkling like red-hot lava, looked, like just, looked just like a group of fireflies. They danced, closed in, and attacked. <sighs> Come on! Whoever wants to eat these bullets, Maria Chamber, for me, step forward!
Uh, damn, that scene always gets to me so much. Maria's lines are so good. That's like such, ooh, it's such a good cornerstone of like the entire series, really. It's like the, the whole idea that like, you know, your worst sides and your best sides, th they coexist. It's not as if they're different, you know, people. It's not as if you can just like, s like separate them conveniently and be like, oh, you know, Rosa, when she's acting terrible, that's not Rosa. That's, you know, that's just a different Rosa. That's a Black Witch, whatever. Like, y whatever you want to say, like, all of these individual parts of a person all make up a complete person, and it's very, very complicated. And it's, yeah. Ah, man. So good. It's so good. Anyway, we got to be getting to the tea party. So let's do that. Purgatorio. Rosa woke up from her doze. It must have been a very deep sleep. Her mind was fuzzy, and she wasn't thinking clearly. Uh, Canadian $5 from Elster. So, uh, where can I submit my application to be Beato's Furniture? I am asking for a friend, I promise. Buddy, get in line. <laughs> that line is a mile- well, it's longer than a mile long, I can guarantee that. <clears throat> <clears throat> where was she? It felt like some mansion, but it at least didn't seem to be the Ashiramiya family mansion. She was in a room that looked like a parlor, and there was some tea that had been prepared. It had almost certainly been prepared for her. Uh, be the one worst battler line incoming. Yes, it is literally like the single worst, like gross anime joke in the entire series. And I do plan to like, basically just skip right over it because I do not want to see it. It like, I fucking hate it. Um, thankfully after that line, uh, all of the like gross anime jokes pretty much like start tapering off. Uh, from that point on, like, it, it kind of stops being a thing after that. So. <clears throat> anyway. <clears throat> Kitty with the five pounds. Maria deserves the world. Phenomenal voice acting as always. She absolutely does. And thank you so much. Sparkles like gold leaf were dancing around the room, and it looked very dreamlike. She eventually realized they were gold butterflies, which made that stand out even more. There was someone across from her. Female. A lady. The witch of the portrait. The golden witch who has lived for a thousand years, she has already surpassed the limits of humans and it is said that she will appear in response to a human summons, just as demons do, to lend them her power for a price. Likes black tea and ice cream, hates boredom and those who deny her existence. Ha, what's going on with this uh, empty portrait here? Oh, you can't even click on it. <laughs> Battler is gone, gone. <clears throat> She looked like she was having a one-sided conversation. She was probably talking to Rosa. But Rosa's mind was clouded up by a deep fog, and she didn't have a clue what was being said. It can be anything. If there is anything you desire, I will give you it all. You may think of it as a reward for your good luck, or as a proper trade for my demands. To you, it may not be that great a thing at all. But that is how significant this transaction is to me. What is she talking about? I don't know. I don't know. Only considering that I am a witch. I think it would be wise to ask for something that only a witch can grant. Isn't this a rare chance? You can actually receive a favor from me, Beatrice the Golden. <laughs> Finally, Rosa started to feel the blood flowing through her body. Her movements were still sluggish, and she couldn't even voice the words she was thinking. I am commonly called the Golden Witch. Bestowing a mountain of gold like I gave to Kinzo is no problem for me. After all, every pleasure of the human world can be expressed in terms of cash. 
Put another way, gold is human pleasure itself. Can you imagine? A mountain of gold that you couldn't use up as long as you lived. The witch blew on her pipe, and seven colors of smoke covered the area. When she did, the inside of the parlor had suddenly become filled with stacks of gold ingots. It looked like a shining gold-colored wall. If each ingot was worth tens of millions of yen, how much would all of this be worth? It seemed sinful to even think of that number. Uh, Nikki M, you're thinking of a different one. I know the, the Reddit dude bro line, and that one is like also a little obnoxious, but uh, it's not the one that I think is like the worst. Like I said, I'm literally just going to be skipping that outright. <clears throat> However, the human world is difficult. I know that there are some things that cannot be satisfied no matter how high the sky you pile up gold. Into the sky you pile up gold. I know that there are cracks that can't be filled. I won't make light of that. And in fact, I believe that is why this is a gift that only a witch such as I can give. Why don't I fill in those cracks for you? Yes. How about this? It's something that only I can give. You should be very happy. You don't have to say it out loud. I can understand it right away. The cracks in your heart are written on your face. <laughs> Rosa felt a touch of discomfort at the witch, who keep, kept on talking even though she herself hadn't uttered a single word. But since she couldn't speak well and found it difficult even to move a finger, she could do nothing about it, and was unable to do anything but listen. How far back must I trace the deep wounds in your heart in order to heal them? This is deep, deep. Sometimes wounds close up while a fragment of something is still inside. Even when those wounds appear to have healed, they will continue to throb for all eternity. Sometimes you have to open the wound once to completely heal it. As the witch spoke, she was staring deep into Rosa's eyes. What in the world was she peering at? Rosa felt uncomfortable, but she couldn't look away. So this pain of yours was preordained from your very birth. How heartbreaking. You don't have to say it. I understand. I understand. Gradually, Rosa, in turn, was drawn into the witch's eyes. Gradually, the world grew dark, spinning around and round as she was sucked in. Rosa. Rosa. Why are you such an idiot? Oh, oh wait, okay, that was Krauss. <laughs> oh, that's Krauss Nissan's voice. Krauss Nissan is very grown up, so he's very smart. So he hated that stupid kid, Rosa. And he was a very scary person, and I was often hit, and my toys were taken from me and broken. He would say it was a punishment because I did something bad, but I didn't really understand what that was or why I was being punished. I was always punished suddenly, and then after the fact, I was told in a contrived manner that it was a punishment for something or other. But it was always something I didn't remember doing. So I really hated Kraus Nissan. Rosa, Rosa, why are you such an idiot? Oh, that's Ava Nason's voice. Eva Nason is very grown up, so she's very smart. So she hated that stupid kid, Rosa. And she was a very sly person, and I was often lied to, tricked, and bullied a lot. She would say it was because I was stupid, and that it was only natural for stupid people to be swindled by those smarter than them. So I wanted to become a wise person like Eva Nason, and listened to what she had to say. But when I obeyed her, for some reason, someone always really got mad at me. So I really hated Ava Nason. Rosa, Rosa, why are you such an idiot? Oh, that's Rudolf Nissan's voice. Rudolf Nissan is very shrewd, so he hated the stupid kid, Rosa. When Kraus Nissan was around, he was friendly with Kraus Nissan. When Eva Nason was around, he was friendly with Eva Nason. And when Kraus Nissan wasn't around, he was violent like Kraus Nissan. 
When Ava Nason wasn't around, he played dirty tricks like Ava Nason. And even though he too was bullied most of the time, when Kraus Nissan and Ava Nason weren't around, he gave me two people's worth of bullying. So I really hated Rudolf Nissan. Oh, but these are my memories from when I was a kid. Quite a lot of unfair things happen when you're a kid, and you can't drag them out forever. In time, you bury them away in the far reaches of memory and forget them bit by bit. That's supposed to be what it means to grow up and become an adult. So becoming an adult is the same thing as separating yourself from all of those memories. And so, no matter how much time had passed, Rosa couldn't become an adult. Even though she had been blessed with a daughter called Maria and was called a mother, she didn't at all feel like she had become an adult. The witch pitied that. And she smiled, saying that she could heal that pain herself. How to heal you? It's possible, but not easy. I could even rewind time and give you a world where you have no elder siblings. But that way, your memories of being hurt by your elder siblings wouldn't remain, and therefore you would be unable to acknowledge it as a reward. It is the relieving of hunger that brings satisfaction. If you erase hunger itself, no one will thank you. Just like how there are no young people who give thanks for their daily gluttony. Understand? I think she just told me something really difficult. In short, even if she makes it so that I never had elder siblings, the pain wouldn't be removed. Maybe that's what she is saying. Strictly speaking, it's different. Healing isn't the same thing as removing pain. It's the pleasure earned for withstanding pain. Therefore, there can be no healing without pain. To know the joy of healing, you have to know pain. In that case, you will require joy that compensates for your pain. You can feel proud of the past you have suffered because you are qualified to know a kind of pleasure that those who have not known suffering cannot taste. Those who have, that have known this pleasure cannot help but give the same joy to others. <laughs> the witch snapped her fingers, and even though the room was still filled with a mountain of gold and was already like something from another world, a fabulous tablecloth appeared on top of the table. And wonderful cooking was laid out, almost as though it was the opening of a banquet in a castle from some fairy tale. For an instant, Rosa felt a pleasurable surprise at how fabulous it was, but at the same time, she felt a bit of anticlimax, because she found herself thinking that being bullied by her siblings couldn't be wiped away by just one meal, no matter how delicious. Food contains many of the human pleasures. You must eat like a pig as long as you live. If one meal isn't enough, then as many as you want. Let us continue this gourmet banquet until the pain of your heart is healed. Begin, furniture. As the witch clapped twice, there were suddenly goat-head servants there, and they began to prepare the meal. From the be beautiful food dishes adorning the table, they efficiently took some food and began to pile it up on Rosa's plate. It really did look delicious, but Rosa's body still felt heavy as lead. And there, and there was no way she could eat. Maybe they also understood that. The goathead servants tied a napkin around Rosa's collar and gallantly brought a glass of before-dinner alcohol to her mouth and even tilted it for her. She remembered an old servant who had once carried rice porridge to her mouth when she was laid up with a high fever. She couldn't drink it well, and it dripped down from her mouth, but she felt the fragrant sweetness spread throughout her mouth. It's a sweet ap aperitif of a noble wrought German-made wine, a wine cocktail of white, white wine tinged with crimson golden drops. If I had to give it a name, I'd call it a bloody kraus. The color comes solely from golden drops of your bro brother's blood, obtained by placing him in a compressor. <coughs> Rosa coughed violently, and the bright red that stained her face made it look as though she had coughed up blood. You know a lot about black tea, so you should know what it means, right? Golden drop refers to the last drop. It's called the most precious drop in a black tea. So a golden drop of blood is the same. The last and most precious drop of blood squeezed out of a human. It's squeezed with that. As the witch snapped her fingers, a bright red veil was pulled off something large which had not been there mere moments ago. The solemn and massive machine there was just like a coffin for a large-sized person, 
with many large bulb-like things stuck to it, and it looked like a sinister torture device. By its unnerving shape, you could tell when it, that it used manpower to tighten and compress something, and it seemed there that there was it seemed that there were still some squeezed dregs remain, remaining inside, because of the bright red remains that stained it. But you can't take more than one golden drop at once. No matter what kind of human you take it from, you can't get more than one drop. But I am a witch. It is also easy to revive a person. When the witch snapped her fingers, suddenly the human compressor began to shake. No, you could also hear a groan. It looked almost as though someone had been sleeping in that man-sized coffin, had woken up, and was now struggling to get out. But that was wrong. What was inside had definitely been squeezed dregs. Using her magic, the witch had once again revived the squeezed dregs to how they had been before when they were squeezed. Three head and goat head servants with muscular physiques approached the compressor and forcefully started tightening the large bolts, bulbs. As they did, an unearthly moan came from inside of the coffin. Rosa thought she knew the owner of that voice. It is fitting for a cook and cooking to be done in the kitchen. That is enough. Stand back. Do you understand now how precious a golden drop is? To have it stained this crimson requires that several dozen people's worth be squeezed. The witch had definitely said that only one golden drop could be taken from a single human. And yet, she had dozens of people's worth of golden drops from a single human. Only a witch could do this. The golden witch Beatrice could kill a single human endlessly. In other words, before Beatrice, even death did not mean release. Want a second sip? Have you forgotten the day this man hit you, and you swallowed the blood that ran into your mouth? That's right. Remember that taste. Remember the taste of the tears that you spilled until you were dry. I believe this apparatus will be sufficient to heal that regrettable memory. <laughs> Once again, the goat had servants tilted the deep red glass against her mouth. Rosa attempted to close her lips in resistance, but the deep red liquid was relentlessly poured into her mouth, which was hanging open with shock, and the inside of her mouth was filled with a ghastly sweetness. It was definitely a fragrant sweetness. Her brother, who she had thought of so hatefully, and who had made her soak her pillow so many times, had died dozens of times over to tinge this wine crimson, so it must have tasted sweet but Rosa tried to spit it out. Because of that, the deep red wine that spilled out of Rosa's mouth made her look as if she was covered in blood. If the ghastly substance was only the imperative, Rosa couldn't help but feel uncomfortable as to what would happen if this banquet continued. That is a forked tongue salad made from vegetables in season. On your ninth birthday, you wished you could bite it off someday. So here's that salad you desired, made from Ava's tongue. <coughs> When Rosa heard the true nature of this pink-colored meat piled up in the salad, she had a sudden impulse to vomit her guts out. Furthermore, the goat servant stuck a fork in it and carried it to Rosa's mouth. How does your sister's forked tongue taste? It must be quite soft and enchanting, right? <laughs> How sweet, soft, and enchanting it must have tasted in her mouth. After all, Ava's lies were always sweet, and young Rosa had li always listened to them. So you could say the taste of the stimulating pepper seasoning that had been added expressed the details of those lies well. <coughs> Rosa spat out the tongue salad that kept being pushed into her mouth, covering it with saliva. But the goathead servants carefully returned it to the plate and carried it to Rosa's mouth over and over again. It goes without saying that I made this salad generously using five of Ava's tongues. You can't steal more than one tongue out of one person, but I can steal it over and over. <laughs> As Rosa's tears dripped down, she resisted, half crazed. However, the only way she could resist was by refusing to swallow, even if she didn't swallow it. The taste of the French dressing increasingly violated Rosa's mouth. Is it not to your satisfaction? There's still much more food. Sea base pie wrapped in the skin of Rudolph's face. Soup with boiled brains, liver plate. And look forward to dessert. 
It's not just your siblings, see. I have lavishly arranged all those who you would have trusted and yet betrayed you. Why don't we continue this banquet for all eternity, until your heart is satisfied. For all eternity. You're happy, right? Ushiro Mia Rosa! Don't pretend that you hate it. I know that you're really happy, all right? If you want to laugh, then laugh. I won't feel better if you won't feel better until you've heard a live performance of your annoying elder sibling's screams, then I'll let you hear them as often as you want. It's all right that you are so unwilling. That's your personality, isn't it? You're actually so happy that your skin is crawling all over. And yet, on the outside, you're just pretending to act like you're in pain, aren't you? It's all right. There's no need to worry about honor or your public image or anything here. So laugh as much as you want and chew it to bits. Isn't this the best banquet? Ushiro Mia Rosa! <laughs> Please, stop. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was keeping the dessert a secret to surprise you, but let me reveal it anyways. If I reveal it, maybe that will be enough incentive for you to eat up the full course. The dessert is that beloved daughter that you had to keep pretending to love. An oven-baked Maria and apples. Doesn't that sound yummy? If you eat this, you will be released from everything. Freedom, you see. Freedom! Finally, Rosa will gain freedom as an individual person! Aren't you happy? Of course you are. <laughs> Jewel is hanging from your mouth. Just try looking in a mirror! <laughs> Suddenly, a muscular goat head cook was holding Maria under his arm, and Maria gazed at Rosa with a face that was just slightly sad. Mama. Was I... a burden? <laughs> you aren't a burden! <laughs> as Rosa spat out the food that was continually being carried to her mouth, as she was covered with mess and saliva and blood, she resisted filthily and screamed. If you... think I'm a burden, Mama, I'm fine with being eaten. After all, I always do horrible things to you, Mama. Even when you brought a man over, I couldn't stay quiet. When you stayed over with the man, I got lonely and unruly and made a mess of the room. When I went to search by myself, I got lost. The police had to pick me up, and I brought shame on you, Mama. When you didn't come home for days, I cried and had to be cheered up by the neighbors and brought shame on you again, Mama. Because I'm like this, I caused trouble for you, Mama. I'm sorry for being born. So I'll become delicious oven-baked apples for you, Mama. And then... Maybe I could make you happy I exist for the first time. Maybe if you eat me and think I'm delicious. She will be, right? I need to catch my breath for a second. <sighs> Hold on. <clears throat> Maria's voice is actually quite difficult to do. <sighs> <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Be choked up with tears of gratitude your daughter is saying this much for you, see? Oven baked apples and your beloved daughter make for the best dessert. I'll start with the two Canadian dollars, bone apple teeth. Yeah, I guess there is bones and teeth involved here, isn't there? <clears throat> You've managed to raise such delicious ingredients. Aren't you the best mother? Ushiro Mia Rosa! <laughs> Mama, thanks for everything. Bye bye. Wait! Wait, Maria, that's wrong! Stop it already! Stop it already! No! <laughs> June Pop 45 with the twenty dollars. Twenty dollars for <laughs> one for each tear I shed. Oh, there's there's gonna be more of those where that came from. But thank you, thank you. I didn't want something like this. Please stop. Please let me go. No. Stop it already. Don't put it in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Have you 
found my hospitality to your satisfaction, then I'll have you accept it. That I am a witch. Proclaim it. Proclaim that Ashira Mia Rosa accepts that Beatrice is a witch. I accept it. Ashira Mia Rosa accepts that Beatrice is a witch. So give Maria back. Release me. <laughs> <laughs> I finally made you accept it! That smart alecky battler is already submitted, and now I've even made Rosa accept it! The fool who denied me, even after being invited to the Golden Land. Perfect! It's perfect! I've accomplished my perfect victory. <laughs> Now, take Maria away. Prepare a delicious oven roast for Rosa. No! No! Maria! Looks delicious. Slice up your cow tits and make me a sandwich. What? Th that voice! <coughs> An arm grabbed the back of the witch's head and smashed her face into the table. As it did, the witch broke to pieces, turned into a group of gold butterflies, and reformed into her body a short distance away. Battler! You, you cursed man! I thought you became furniture! That you submitted down to your very soul! I thought I did too. But while I was listening to your gross recipes, I started to get a little hungry. Now I feel like eating a whole roast witch! And Maria. I'm gonna skip this line. Don't say that, don't say that, okay, yeah. It's out of the way, thank God. <clears throat> but, Badler could. Sorry to keep you waiting, Auntie Rosa. I'd forgotten. This was a one-on-one -on -one fight between me and this woman. I was never supposed to give in. Thanks to your persistence, I've gained my will to fight. Th this man. He was broken down to the depths of his soul and capitulated to me. I see. He doesn't know when to give up. Just what I'd expect from Mashiro Miyakinzo's grandson. So the chick of a phoenix is a phoenix after all. <laughs> How vigorous. I like it. I wouldn't have it any other way. Oh, whoops. That is exactly what I expect from you, Ushiro Miya Battler. Try to deny me. I'll completely and thoroughly smash you to bits. I will break you over and over again. I'll teach you, one who has licked my shoes, the taste of defeat over and over. No problem. I'll teach you that I, Ushiro Mia Battler, am a man who will stand to back up even after crawling in the mud. I've never had the experience of being invincible in a fight. I've lost many times. But I always crawl through the mud and stand up again. And I always finish what I started. In a man's fight, you don't lose until you accept defeat, no matter how much you get beat up. Don't think that I'm out just because you took a shot at me! Entertain me! Beatrice! I'll accept your challenge, Ushiro Mia Battler! Furniture, begin preparations for the next game. And while we're waiting, I have much I want to hear from you. There were many locked rooms in this game. Using red, I've smashed to bits most of the methods by which you tried to talk yourself out. What other evasive quibbles will you show me now? The lock to the chapel, the lock to Jessica's room, the lock to the servant room, the lock to Natsuhi's room, the lock to the parlor. Use all of those things you humans are so good at pulling out of the blue. Your delusions, rantings, daydreams, bluffs, all slanted with ridiculous, incredible turns of event, and show how thoroughly you can deny me! Uh, it's no good. It's no goddamn good at all! <sighs> and we still have the extra tea party after this. Oh boy, but I'm gonna take a breath while that uh, credits is rolling. Thank you everybody also for bearing with me for skipping that horrible, horrible line. Like I said before, um, thankfully, pretty much like all of the gross anime jokes from Battler are 
gone from this point on. Like, they do not come back. I guess maybe, like, Ryukishi had the revelation that, like, oh, maybe that sucks and I shouldn't do it. So he... Yeah. So there you go. <clears throat> Oh, thank you. Thank you for the compliments on the voice acting. I, I had to put everything I had into the finale of this episode because there are so many good iconic moments in it. <laughs> I was gonna put on uh, Kyrie MatPat for a second, but there are subtitles for the song that's playing right now, so uh, I guess I'll just let it go for now. <clears throat> yeah, anybody who missed it, feel free to just, <laughs> like, don't. Just don't even, like, do yourself a favor and just don't even go back for it. It's horrible. It's so fucking horrible. <clears throat> uh, just lay my head down for a second. Are we theorizing before the question marks? Uh, you can feel free to if you want, because this will take a second to go through, so... Go right ahead if you wish. I'm just taking a breath. I'll start with the two Canadian dollars. I saw the line, wish I didn't. Yep, I told you. I told you. Oh, you know what? Wait, do we have any photos on the screen anymore? Hold on. No! Okay. They're all in the kitchen. On this way. Oh well. <clears throat> oh yeah, Lair, if you'll keep an eye on it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'll mute my mic for a second to go. All right, I return with soda. What's everybody saying? Mm -mm -mm. I've been thinking this a while, but I wonder if the history between Kinzo and Beatrice is a little similar to the dance Battler and Beato are doing now. It would fit the theme of things going in circles. Perhaps. Kinzo has definitely talked about playing a, a game with a Beatrice before, has talked about like uh, the contest, chess, whatever. So uh, however you want to interpret that. There's definitely room for speculating. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Future Skeleton. Beatrice said in red that they definitely passed through the chapel door, but did she ever confirm that there are no hidden passages to the chapel? I believe so, yes. I'm pretty sure. Um... Daniel, so that last scene is at, le at least appears to shoot my narrator theory in the foot. So, but maybe the last scene still took place in some nebulous space that tea parties take place in. Anyway, it was good. <laughs> ah, got him again. The golden chef always gets his meal. <laughs> um. Atropos, I was looking at episode one again to do content warnings, and I noticed that the murders are carried out by the one with the golden key, which presumably means that someone has solved the riddles and gotten the key. Maybe? Perhaps? 
But uh, remember that Beatrice said that if anybody solved the riddle of the epitaph, that she would stop the murders. Or that she would stop the ritual, at the very least. So, uh, I don't know. Strange. It is incredible how absolutely impossible to root against Battler it is, despite the odd animeism every so often. Yeah, Battler has a lot of, like, lines that I hate in the early parts of the story, but, like, ignoring those, I do think he is a very well-written protagonist. He has flaws. He's definitely very bullheaded. There are th things that he can't get around, especially in this episode, which kind of dooms him in this one, because he's totally unwilling to believe that any person in his family could have done it and it like completely paralyzes his ability to like make judgments um but yeah i think like i don't know i i really like that he is so empathetic i like that he is so emotionally open um and even when he's saying some absolute bullshit you just want to believe in him My only idea is that the supernatural only works if people believe in them. There is some merit to that. Obviously, Beatrice has talked before about how she can only revive if everybody present believes in her. You know, there's the whole thing at the end of the episode one tea party where Battler doesn't believe, so the illusion starts to dissipate. Yeah, Atropos. Like, he goes, no, actually everyone is innocent, but also there is no witch. Like, yeah, you you, you can't have both, buddy. You, you have to pick one. Battler's inability to pick one in this game is really his downfall, uh, in this episode in particular. But, uh, he's getting back up. He's getting at it. Maybe he'll figure it out. We just gotta, gotta believe and hope that things will go better for him in episode three. <clears throat> Theory, Beato gets a low taper fade next chapter. I will neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> I have a question. So if we hypothetically think there is no witch, does that mean all of these scenes are metaphorical? I don't know. Um, could be. <laughs> Sorry to be such a cheeky bitch, but that's really all I can say right now is just, could be. <laughs> Realistically, my only reason for thinking the murders are non-magical is that that would be narratively unsatisfying. Perhaps that's uh, an expectation that is certainly attached to mystery media. And uh, boy does Umineko talk about mystery media. It's really interesting that this chapter is kind of a treadmill, but I'm eager to see how the next chapter changes. Presumably, Battler has learned something from this one. Oh, you would have to to hope that he had learned from this. There's <laughs> He went through a lot at the end of this one. I, I would hope that he learned his lesson. <clears throat> um, all right. Well, everybody... No more theorizing for a minute. We gotta do the final hidden tea party. Well then, did you enjoy it? Our game just now. A game that one-sided goes beyond captivating and becomes boring. <laughs> my, my, a harsh critic as always. And I was so certain that even Lady Vernkastel, who has no love for boredom, would surely be satisfied by this compelling development. How remorseless. Well, I'll accept that it was compelling. However, it was horrible as a fair game. You need the conditions to be a little more even, or... Am I about to be told there's no way to win? By Lady Vernkastel? <laughs> I wonder what you mean by that, Beato. 
There's no need to play ignorant. I already know that you aren't a bystander. You thought you were hiding it? How insolent to travel all that having a large stake placed in my defeat. I've guessed right, haven't I? And if so? <laughs> Truly interesting. Then I should be that I should be granted a chance to fight against Lady Burncastell, the strongest of witches who defeated Lady Lambda Delta. It's truly a pleasure. Yes, it's pleasing me too. After all, I came all this way just because I wanted to see you brimming with that confidence, only to fall apart and lose. <laughs> what an honest person. <laughs> Incidentally, at the contest between me and the great Lady Burncastell, we're not to have at least one observer. What a tremendous shame that would be. You called her, didn't you? That child. Oh! <laughs> I found you! I finally found you, Burn Castell! <sighs> How are you, Lambda? Looks like you also have time to kill. I wonder if it's fate that we who share no love for boredom should run into each other again. Such a dumb kid. Why can't you realize that the only reason you won against me was because of a little luck and a not-so-great matchup? That made you so snobby, and now you're even picking a fight with Beatrice? Shouldn't you learn your place? <laughs> Beatrice's strong, you know. And she's more brutal than I am. Just a teensy bit. Oh, and also, don't just shorten someone's name to Lambda. You're a fool too, Beato. This kid won't make exceptions for your game. She'll turn everything into a preposterous farce. I didn't bring Lady Lambda Delta here solely to watch from the sidelines. Lambda Delta, the witch of certainty who has lived for a thousand years, she embodies the idea that hard workers are rewarded and is highly respected even by humans. Though she is a witch, she does not stray far from the concepts of humans. For that reason, her power as one worshipped by humans is incalculable. However, she is fickle about whose efforts she chooses to reward, and in many cases she bestows her favor upon those who can please her the most. Her massive, swift, and terrifying power can cause any witch to submit in an instant. However, she is often reckless, and Burncastell was able to take full advantage of that. After I informed her that you were betting against me, she said that she would be betting against you. Elster, uh, with the Canadian $2, Austin should do his Mock Vegeta voice for Lamb. Austin is not here. He is asleep. He is still asleep. Also, he he's not gonna be boarding for all of my streams. He doesn't want to be here for all that. You're still holding a grudge, aren't you? Because I'm the strongest witch in the universe. But I lost to you, so I'm not the strongest. So I'm taking the side of anyone who's against you! <laughs> there you have it. With the great Lady Burncastell as our opponent, this may not even count as a handicap, but it will be suitable for entertainment. Do as you like. Now that the cat's out of the bag, I'm going to get serious. That would be suitable. So, real quick, so that nobody is under any illusions here in the chat, because obviously I know with uh, anime it can be difficult to ascertain what is actually serious and what is a joke. Uh, Lambda Delta and Burn Castell are literally gay. They are 100% canonically gay. <laughs> Just so you know. Um... <clears throat> also, I just think one of the things that's really cool about their dynamic, even though you've just met them, is that uh, Bern Castell is the Witch of Miracles, and Lambda Delta is the Witch of Certainty. Uh, the idea of something miraculous happening is something that's like cannot be accounted for. It is so out of this world that it is literally a miracle. And uh, Lambda Delta is the Witch of Certainty, meaning like, a certainty, a fact, a, like, 
fact of the universe. They have a push and pull, like, inherently to their own beings. That, like, they are somehow, like, polar opposites, and yet they draw each other in. It's so... Oh, it's so... It's so Yuri. <laughs> Anywho. <clears throat> that would be suitable. Leniency has never featured in my dictionary. <laughs> Lady Lambda Delta, let us enjoy our valuable new relationship. Yes, I'll be counting on you, Lady Beatrice. This girl really put me through the ringer. I'm not going to be happy until the two of us have smushed her up and paid her back double. I look forward to it, Lambda. And Beato. No matter who wins or who loses, this will be a very meaningful battle for us. That's right. I'm not going to lose easy, but this is more important than winning and losing. After all, we have no love for boredom. <laughs> the three witches giggled, cackled, and guffawed. That's right. I should thank you, Beato. It looks like I can finally escape boredom. Do your best to entertain me, together with Lambda Delta. I shall do just that. <laughs> That's that, Beato. So let's start a strategy meeting right now. I know all of this girl's weak points, and I'm going to teach you all of them. And yet, Lady Lambda Delta, you were, defi you were defeated by her, I note. <laughs> Ugh, I won't tell you, I won't tell you. Soon. <laughs> uh, the cat lurking. Uh, first of all, let's let's cool it on the uh, Higurashi spoiler stuff. Also, Ryukishi said in an interview that uh, that is not literally the case. Uh, as like as for whether she is supposed to be like talking to her or whatever, like he he has said that that is not the case. Now, granted. Lambda is a little bit more complicated than just being analogously one character or another, so... But I feel that that is worth mentioning. She never bores, that Lady Lambda Delta. She doesn't, does she? Take care of her. She might not look it, but she gets lonely. I see. So she's one of those newfangled whatchamacallits. <laughs> As expected from Lady Lambda Delta, quite cutting edge. <laughs> Go already. That child's waiting for you to chase after her. Then, if you'll excuse me. See you next game. <laughs> I'm sorry. A troublesome one came, but don't mind her. More importantly, things sure got ugly. I thought I'd experienced some particularly gruesome ends in my game with Lambda, but this time, it's exceptionally horrible. It isn't as though I don't understand your desire to hug your knees and close your heart. If you meet that end several more times, your heart will be killed within a hundred years. Beato saw through me, so I'll confess. You are now just like I was in the past, when I was imprisoned inside Lambda's world. Shut inside a labyrinth of cruel fate, tormented at the whims of a witch. I'm a witch who was born from there, so maybe I'm like an older sister to you. So I decided that I'll lend you my power. However, even compared to my fate, yours is truly brutal. Not only do I sympathize with you, I'm almost brought to tears by your tragic fate. But please, don't lose heart. Please don't submit to Beato, no matter what. Certainly, that child's game is quite unfair. I took a glimpse of the game board, and the tricks are so mean and cunning, and the scenic tricks are filthy to a degree that probably far surpasses that of Lambda Delta's game board. And what's even more frightening is that when that child moves a piece, it's not like she always makes the best possible moves. This is where she's very different from Lambda. Uh, Silk Moth, who Burn is talking to right now is, uh, 
a mystery. Yeah, it is is intentionally ambiguous. <clears throat> Bebeto sometimes intentionally eases up when she moves her pieces. This is unfortunate for us, trying to seek out our opponent's strategy by looking at her moves. Because it creates a formidable amount of noise in our information, this disorder could be troublesome. However, as in chess, a player might be able to create some noise for their opponent with a useless move, but they would still miss out on a more valuable move. In other words, it's not like your opportunities to take advantage of it are zero. Although you may not be able to believe it, this game was also like that. Even though those developments looked so overpowering, there actually were, we there actually were weak points. It looks almost as if she wants us to take advantage of them. Although I don't know if it's a trap or if she's testing us. Anyway, don't surrender. Don't stop thinking. Don't deny any possibility. As long as you continue to hold the will to fight, Beato will not win. Defense is crucial during a witch's battle, you, see, you know. Rather than trying to win, try not to lose. If you lose when you accept her, then you definitely must not accept her. Making you accept witches. There is no longer any doubt that that is one of Beatrice's victory conditions. Now that I have announced that I am your ally, I too will make an effort to lend you as much of my power as I can. Make an effort yourself as well. If you're still hugging your knees, quickly stand back up. Um, in times like these, what did I used to say again? Um, uh... <laughs> oh yeah, Higurashi reference coming up here. Fit. Fight! Yeah! Nipa. <laughs> That's what she says in the fucking Japanese. Oh, okay, she, yeah, I thought they were replacing it with the yeah, but there it is. Me, Nipa. <laughs> it's so embarrassing doing this. I've done this much for you, so hurry and stand back up. Hi, Lambda. <clears throat> ah, there you are. Did Bryn shrink off somewhere? <laughs> Could she be any more lame? Anywho, the pieces Bryn chooses are crummy as usual, huh? It's the same with chess, right? If all your pieces were pawns, you'd have zero chances to win, right? If all your pieces were rooks and bishops, no way you'd lose. Well, well, last time. I felt just a little pity and said that she could start her pieces wherever she wants. And then that idiot Burn totally didn't pick up on my compassion and started with all her pawns promoted on the 8th rank. What's up with that? That wasn't a loss or anything. Ugh. Just remembering that makes me uneasy. It makes me queasy. So see, I'm going to be ruffled until I see Burn's stupid speechless face. So it's like, seeing you in this state as Burn's piece, that makes me feel just awesome. <laughs> Plus, believe it or not, that girl really hates to lose. So I bet she's definitely grinding her teeth in frustration right about now, crying like a baby. So she's, she's so lame. <laughs> Come on, laugh with me. Oh. <laughs> Wait a sec. Are you still hugging your knees? Uh, you're already like this just because Beato got a little serious? Could you be any more pathetic? You're so pathetic. I'll help you just a little bit. I, the Great Lady Lambda Delta, the Witch of Certainty, and the strongest in the universe, will bring your hopeless chances of winning just a teensy bit closer to certainty. You better thank me. You know, Beatrice may really be a cruel and powerful witch, but she's no match for me. Why? Because she's soft. That kid will make the board so she can win with just a few more moves, but she deliberately won't finish you off. She'll do stuff like take worthless pieces or put way too many pieces on the board to make things even more one-sided. The point is, she's got this bad habit of playing around when she thinks she's gonna win. Almost all the various attacks that are very painful for you and Burn look like a total waste and overkill to me. Basically, that's her weakness, and it's also your chance. See? She isn't an opponent to be afraid of, right? She sometimes mistakes the means for the end. And she has a... And she has too much bad fun. A 
As a result, she makes and even exposes her own weak points. It's impossible for a strongest ever witch like me to understand why she acts so relaxed. Lowering her own chances of winning. But, well, that's why the type of witch, witch like Burn, who reads her opponent and dodges their moves, has a really bad matchup with her. Because reading her doesn't work. It's probably really easy for Burn to read and handle an obedient and honest type like me. That makes me so mad. Well, still, a super firepower type like me can easily go head-on against a light, wide-range barrage type like Beatrice. So I guess it's kind of like rock, paper, scissors. If I'm paper, Beato is rock. I guess burn would be scissors. Well, maybe none of that matters anyway. Sure, my paper loses to burn scissors, but if it was way more, but if it was way more awesome super paper, which is thick as wood, it could be even scissors, right? In other words, I, Lady Lambda Delta, am super paper and super thick. The joke is that she's calling herself an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like the colors come back to your face a little. The be that Beato, she's having fun torturing some piece called Rosa. At a glance, you'd think she has really nasty hobbies, right? Wrong, though. She's just killing time, hoping you'll get up and come back. It's a move to fire up your righteous indignation by doing something to make you hate her on purpose. Ah, oh, man. I hate kids like that. Well then, I'll go back. Ah, don't you tell anyone that I helped you out just a teensy bit. I mean, it's not like I helped you because I wanted to save you, okay? I, the strongest witch in the universe, had my seat as the strongest stolen when I lost to Burn. So it's like, ugh, I have to take that seat back from Burn. If, but if Burn loses to Beato here, then the position of the strongest will be moved to Beato this time, right? Well, it'd be easier to steal it back from Beato, so who cares really, but that won't satisfy me, you know what I mean? I'm going to be the one to defeat Burn, and I'll take my, back my position as the strongest. It's not like I'm really helping you, okay? I won't forgive you if you make Burn cry. And there we go. That, my lovely chat, is episode two of Umineko. It's done! And we have a new title screen. But, let's, uh, let's check out some of this stuff real quick. So what does Battler's Execute say? Missing. Surrendered once to the witch, but pulled himself together and made the decision to fight once more. I see. So witches find Battler to be a toy worth breaking. The Nat explains why she breaks him a little, fixes him, and then breaks him again. Torture is meaningless if you kill the subject. You have to alternate between causing them pain and letting them rest. Jim Pop 45 with the $5. Umineko when lesbians cry. <laughs> True. <clears throat> So, uh, let's see what Rosa says, actually. In the Golden Land, she finally found a treasure more precious to her than gold. However, that was short-lived. Thanks to the idiot, she would once again have to lose that which she had finally found. Afterwards, she was chewed into a pulp by demons and went to hell. What does Maria say? Missing. In the Golden Land, she learned that her mama still loves her. Satisfied for now. As for the witch's side... Oh. Oh, they just give you all of them? Okay. Well, sure. I guess we can just look at the stakes profiles then. <clears throat> Seven Sisters of Purgatory. Eldest Sister Lucifer. Advanced level furniture created by Beatrice. Can move of her own accord, but cannot disobey her summoner's orders. Possesses significant power even in human form, but her terrifying full potential is truly unleashed only upon returning to her original form as one of the seven stakes of purgatory and soaring at the enemy at high speeds. Haughty and arrogant, but actually feels pleasure from submission. Leviathan? 
uh, basically the same uh, first description, but nothing but a jealous crybaby. She'll do whatever it takes to get what she wants. Satan, really grumpy, but actually wants others to get angry with her. <laughs> Belphegor, thoughtful and hardworking. Because of this, she corrupts her masters. Mammong, really greedy. Once she decides she wants something, she will sacrifice anything and everything to get it. Beelzebub, in fact a gourmet, would use any ingredients to make a good meal, even her own body. And Asmodeus, at that age where she wants a boyfriend, would give up her life for love. And let's check these other... Uh, yeah, I guess, does, does Kinzo have a different profile here than, yes, he does. What does uh, Kinzo's witch side thing say? Oh yeah, I'll look at uh, human side Kinzo's death in a second. <clears throat> a self-taught human mage, his natural talent and level of knowledge are nothing special, but when his nearly insane powers of concentration and dedication were transformed into magical power, he awakened as a great mage. His power is at least great enough that he was able to summon Beatrice and form a contract with her. Though his power is great, it is also extremely lopsided. In particular, he specialized in summoning and barriers, so perhaps it is fitting to call him a summoner instead. So, okay, let's see what uh, Kenzo's human side thing says. Missing. Finally reached the golden land he so desired. The idiot was once again unwilling to accept that, so the magic was spoiled for a second time. Even so, he was probably happy. After all, he managed to be reunited with the golden witch, if only for a brief time. Afterwards, he was crunched to pieces and eaten by demons and went to hell. Does it say anything different if you execute him on the witch? Oh, wait, you can't execute him on the witch side. Never mind. So what does Battler say? An unfortunate young man to whom Beatrice has taken a liking. A human who inherited the black blood from Kinzo. Inherited the massive resistance to magical power that Kinzo was born with. Ironically, it was this trait that made it so hard for Kinzo to succeed as a mage. A massive magic defense can be an ace in the hole for a battle against a witch. Kinzo has begun to lose his power with age, but Battler's power is still on the rise. Perhaps it's understandable why Beatrice tried to crush it as soon as possible. Maria. A little mage who has inherited the black blood from Kinzo. Unlike Kinzo, she was gifted with a natural talent and began to tread the path of the mage while still young. That said, her power is still weak and she is no more than an apprentice. However, she is skilled with enchantments which bestow magical power upon objects, and the magical items she creates compete with those of the Meister class. Genji. Kinzo's earliest furniture, which he created to serve him and him alone with complete loyalty. Though he was Kinzo's first creation, he was made with the help of a high-class demon, so there, there were, though there were several flaws in his initial specs, he concealed a great potential within himself. In the many years following that, he began to mature and compensate for his many deficiencies, turning himself into the nearly flawless butler furniture that he is now. He is approaching the limit of his service life, but the magical power he can unleash for an instant rivals Kinzo's. Shannon. Shannon is Kinzo's handmade furniture in the purest sense, which he created without borrowing the power of demons. Though there were problems with several of her initial specs, she was given a very rare and precious thing, a heart. It seems that as a result of his long personal experience, Kinzo came to believe that the power created by the heart contains within it a strong magic. In the lengthy span of time following that, she began to mature, becoming exceptionally skilled with power of protective or repulsive natures such as magical barriers. Because of this, in the realm of barriers alone, she possesses an immense mage class level of power. And Kanon. The last furniture created by Kinzo thus far. Making use of all of his previous experience, Kinzo managed to implement a set of flawless specs. Kanon was also given a heart, but it was much weaker than Shannon's. Perhaps because Kinzo felt a sense of approaching personal danger related to his fortune as he neared the end of his life, he bestowed Kanon with the rare power to fight and protect. However, he hasn't yet matured very far and is unable to control his own power and speed. So yeah, uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to interpret all of this literally, then yeah, go right ahead. But this is on the witch side of the profiles, so uh, obviously, you know, think what you think what you will. Uh, does, is Burns' description different this time? Yeah, I think it is. 
Or is it? No, I, I think it is. The Witch of Miracles who has lived for a thousand years. Her vast power is capable of creating all kinds of miracles, but her heart has broken a bit as a result. Back when she was a human, Lambda Delta once imprisoned her within a cruel fate, toying with her the whole time. It seems that she is unable to abandon others who are caught within a similar fate. In theory, she holds the strongest power of any witch, but in practice, that is no more realistic than saying a piece of paper can reach the moon if you fold it a hundred times. And fold it a hundred times, she did. Uh, okay, yeah, Beatrice's description is also different. The endless witch who has lived for a thousand years, she is known for being exceptionally cruel even among witches. She loves bullying the weak and is capable of using trial and error endlessly to find the cruelest fate they can possibly be given. And she toys with her victims even further by piling on one after another. This witch is extremely powerful, but word has it that she sometimes becomes obsessed with the art of creating certain patterns so that her means end up becoming her goals. All right. Uh, somebody wanted to see Genji's execution screen, so let me look at that. Missing. The unselfish piece of furniture sought nothing but repose in the Golden Land. However, since the idiot stubbornly rejects the Golden Land, his repose is unlikely to come anytime soon. Afterwards, he was munched to pieces and eaten by demons and went to hell. Welp. Uh, what is Beato's thing if you... Oh yeah, okay. Here's a cool Easter egg. If you hit execute, you get a uh, school uniform Beato. Mysterious visitor in 19th person who appeared on the day of the family conference goes by the same name as the golden witch who granted Kinzo his gold. Both the reason and the purpose of her visit are unknown. She was ushered into the VIP room, which no one had been allowed to use in the past. And if you try to hit it again, you just get... Uh, the same thing that she said last time whenever you try to execute her on the episode one character menu. Is it a school uniform? It looks like more general formal wear. I don't know, like, I, I thought it kind of looked like an academy uniform a little bit. But, uh, I don't know. I guess you could say it's one way or the other. But, uh, yeah, I guess that is all of that stuff. I want to check the tips menu real quick just to see if there's anything that we need to look at before I start theory time. Which is score sheet. Yeah, it's just the same thing. It's the, the letters, the epitaph. What does the brooch say? Okay. So... In order to mediate the relationship between the opposite sex, it favorably edits all of their fate numbers and mediates their relationships. Since it is nothing more than a favorable edit, large differences can be seen in its effects depending on the individual. Hence, if the witch giving this item does not measure with care whether the target she will give this item to, to will be able to use it effectively or not, she risks being called a liar. The activation cost is enormous, and to many human beings it is no more useful than a simple brooch. However, blind love pays enormous costs with ease. If there is goodwill from the other partner in addition, the effects will become even more dramatic. Ironically, the more dramatic the effects are, the less of a need there was for such, such a brooch in the first place. We looked at Lambda's profile whenever she first appeared. Yeah, that's just translation notes. I'll uh, glance at it again real quick. Yep, it's the same one. Okay, okay. We've uh, looked at all of the extra stuff for episode two, so now it's Kyrie MatPat time. Everybody, go ahead. Give me your thoughts. Tell me what you think. What do you think's going on? Unbipal, so we can say for certain that there is someone that claims to be a witch. So there is a 19th person at play regardless if we think there's a witch. Well, we haven't gotten concrete proof of a 19th person, quote unquote, but we do have proof in at least this game. Or well, I guess eh, proof is a strong word, but we have a lot to back up in this specific game that there is a human person that is walking around that is like, I am Beatrice. Like, 
a bunch of people claim to see her. Kyrie claims to see her without even knowing who she is and says, like, yeah, she looks exactly like the woman in the portrait. And Kyrie is, like, the most logic-y, logic-pilled person in the room, so... I wonder, I wonder... Uh, Nikki M, I forgot the exact confirmation, but are the stake demons stated to be Kinzo's or Beatrice's furniture? Let's have a look. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, hold on, let me take Curia and Matt Bat down for a second. Uh, it says that they are created by Beatrice, so they are not Kinzo's furniture. They are Beato's. Daniel the Spaniel with the 20 pounds. Red text, Marcy needs money. I'm glad to catch the end this time and be here with my best art piece as we solve the mystery. Also, obligatory comms open to anyone interested in the chat. I also need money from not my mom. Yes, absolutely. Please commission Daniel. You can see this lovely art right here. We wouldn't have Kyrie MatPat without Dan Daniel. It's very important. Also, thank you. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Be it to the real. Could someone have opened a door and then locked it, but left it cracked open so that they could pass through, then close the door behind them when they were done? I forget if... I'm pretty sure that Beato says with the red earlier that, like, it is impossible to, like, use a trick to, like, open the door or do something like that. I'm pretty sure she says that. Uh, the mansion is a live monster house style and it's opening itself for the culprit. You know what? True enough. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, if magic isn't real, then how are there different timelines and what we know about Higurashi magic isn't too out there? I mean, are there different timelines? I wonder. We haven't proven that. We haven't proven what exactly is happening. So, I don't know. Maybe someone is good at lockpicking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there exists no trick to lock the room from the outside. There is that. And they only exit, entered and exited from the door. Yes. Uh, Atropos, I think it is a Schrodinger's cat type vibe where either the murderers are taken over by Beato or acting in belief that they are possessed by her. Maybe the belief makes it real. That's an interesting theory. Could they all be perhaps acting on behalf of the witch? I mean, you know, the the murders typically follow the epitaph, so I suppose it is possible. Kinzo is stated to be a summoner and has no magical talent. How has he made three different and supposedly powerful furniture? Who oh, no. Have we proven that anything is happening? Maybe Battler's just dreaming. <laughs> yeah, he's just laying in bed like, whoa, that was crazy. <laughs> uh, so what about the door already being already open and once all the killing ended, they closed the door? Well, hold on, let me, let me try to think of what you're saying here. Being already open and once the killing ended, they closed the door. Well, I guess it depends on whether or not you think the person in question was able to lock it somehow after that. Uh, didn't reread the conversation from last time, but it looks like the murderer, at least for the servant room, cannot be Beato. Yeah, she like really hammers on that one. Game is stupid. It's my favorite game. <laughs> True. <laughs> Battler is just on candid camera. His all of his relatives jump out like, "Dude, you, you look so stupid." Um. If we're to believe that there is no witch, that makes the narrator unreliable. Correct. Witch narrator. Kind of a question, not a theory, but if I remember correctly, Burns' profile said that when she was a human, she was tormented by Lambda. Assuming Lambda is based on Satoko, was this foreshadowing? 
Um, I mean, uh, that is assuming that, and I'm not, I'm not gonna get too into Higurashi stuff. Um, got theories about Red-Eyed Canon. Yeah. Anybody uh, wanna talk about Red-Eyed Canon a little bit? Rosa also feels like something of an easy mode for Battler's journey, since he openly accused her of being the killer, and part of his journey is accepting that his family could be the culprits. Yeah, he kind of backtracks on it a little bit afterward, but, uh, I mean, she she makes it hard not to accuse her. Rosa is super sus in this episode. Canon could be a metaphor for abuse slash blackmail slash becoming a monster. Could be. I think it's really interesting that the death orders don't correspond to the Twilight's order. Not sure what it means, but it seems important. Yes, I was waiting to see if somebody would point this out. So uh, let me let me go ahead and return to the human side for a second. Because if you'll remember, Nanjo and Kumasawa's bodies like disappear for a while. Um, and it says finishing touches yet to come. Hold on, let me turn off Kiria Map Hat for a second. It says finishing uh, touches yet to come. And then they find them again and it's like the eighth and se yeah the seventh and eighth twilights even though we know that they were literally killed before goda um shannon and george who are the sixth the fourth and the fifth yeah the fourth fifth and sixth and then nanjo and uh kumasawa are made the seventh and eighth but like that is definitely not the order in which they were killed. Anybody have any thoughts about that? Uh, as I go through the rest of the stuff that I missed. Any narrator that isn't Battler, hell it is unclear if we can even trust Battler's narration. Can we trust anyone? Uh, I believe you're given into the witch a little bit. I tease, I tease. The red text is kind of funny, since really Battler has no reason to trust it, but does anyway. I assumed it was just a meta thing. The game kind of needs it to exist for the plot to move forward. Yeah, it is kind of a, it, it is a little bit of a meta thing. It's just like, you know, this is a game where, like, the entire premise of the game relies on the fact that you can at least have this one thing that can be trusted. If you just loop yourself around in circles saying, oh, maybe the red text isn't reliable, then, like, you know, you're not going to get anywhere. So they need a way to be able to tell you something that is actually important. Um, Beto leaves the door open and then gives the key to Maria. Once everyone got inside, she killed them and then closed the door. But then how does she get out? Or, well, did she lock it from the front? Ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's see. Sorry, I got kind of lost in the in the chat for a second. Red Eye Cannon has the same eyes as the stakes in the bull. Uh, Battler got into a coma after Pikachu thunderbolted the sparrows and is dreaming the events of Umiak. <laughs> oh, a classic. Ah, da 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 da. The ex simple explanation is that the Twilights only refer to when the gouging occurs. That's possible. That is possible. Uh, my crack theory is that Kinza was an older battler because of time loop shenanigans. Oh, I would hate that. <laughs> the rules are bullshit and nothing matters. Uh, once again, another one falls to the witch. <laughs> You have to at least believe in something, or else uh, you won't be able to navigate the game. Sorry, but them's the breaks. <laughs> uh, what should imply the blah blah blah? Not legal gouging. Is the person signifying the Twilight's different from the person who killed Nanjo and Kumasawa? Mm -hmm. Possibly. The the death descriptions are often ambiguous with that sort of thing because sometimes they're definitely Beatrice, and sometimes they feel like they're. Uh, Maria and some, you know, who knows? Um, <laughs> gas leak. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can we get the lesbian witches being gay in red text, even if it's text we can only trust red? Uh, well, yes, hold up. 
sound effect. I had to find it again anyway. I was probably gonna have to break it out again. Burn Castell and Lambda Delta are gay, canonically. There you go. <laughs> Uh, are we starting episode three next stream? Yes. But I will talk about that, like my plans in, in just a minute. Uh, maybe the killer didn't mean to kill Nanjo and the maid when they did, forcing them to reuse their bodies later to keep up the rhythm. I mean, it's possible, but uh, that leaves uh, having to prove why uh, why they would have killed them by accident. In terms of order, I'm also curious about how it says George and Shannon could have been the second Twilight. It sounds too specific to be a throwaway line. Possibly. Or it could just be a reference to them being two who are close. Uh -oh. I was explaining episode one to an old friend. He was convinced the killer was Maria. Before I explained the locked room was only a crack open, he thought only she could be the killer since she's small. <laughs> yeah, she, Maria shrunk herself like a smurf and walked through the crack of the door. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Citrine Ray with the Canadian $2. Gota is the only person on the island I trust. You know, a little bit sad, but also understandable. <laughs> uh, given this chapter gave a new portrait of Beatrice, is it possible we'll even get, say, five portraits and thus can gauge and effectively kill each one for the, ga um, for the gauge twilights? That's an interesting way of looking at it. Perhaps. I don't know. Uh, it's delightful to see the crafting and how people are approaching this so differently. Yeah, absolutely. I love this part of the stream. I always love seeing what you guys think. Okay. Ulster's got a big one. Let's see. The servants named after the demons are humans who became furniture. There are lines in their descriptions that hint to a deal made with the Golden Witch. My best example of this is Asmodeus, whose description tells us she wants a boyfriend and would do anything for it. This may suggest that she made a deal with Beato to get one. We know Beato gives people desires for their soul, like Kinzo with his riches and Shannon with George. I think my memory sucks. Take this with a side of salt. Maybe the servants are all souls who made deals to get what they wanted and then were turned into furniture. They were named after the sin slash demon that represents their desire. That's very interesting. That is very interesting. I... Mm, I can't say anything else about that. I just... I like it. I like it. You're thinking big. You're thinking big-brained. We're going places here. Uh... I truly think there's not enough information to fully solve the mystery. Considering the length of the series, I doubt we have all the pieces we need. Well, that's fair enough, because the first four arcs are, in fact, called the question arcs. So there are going to be a lot of questions that are being uh, thrown around. Uh, but I will say this. By technicality, and really, by technicality, like most of you probably are not going to get it anyway. But, you know, believe me when I say this. By the end of episode four, you will have all the information you need to solve the mystery. There you go. Now, whether you actually do or not, that's a question. But, there you go. Uh, let's see, what else, what else, what else? Sorry if I'm, like, a little behind in the chat, by the way. You know. I do not believe Maria has the physical strength to overpower all the adults in the highly physical way a lot of them are killed. That is a good point to make, because boy, oh boy, are those bodies screwed up. Um... I assume all the furniture people generally made deals... What if the seven sisters are all literally the same person? They have all—they all have the same face, and that doesn't feel like a simple art shortcut. You would be surprised what a man with only five dollars to his name will do. <laughs> but fair enough thing to speculate about. Hmm. 
By the, uh, MB Pal said by the start of episode four or by the end. By the end of episode four. Serious theory, if the master keys are the only ones that could have been used and the servants had them with them the whole time, then one of them is the culprit slash accomplice. My bet is Canon, he could be threatened to help the culprit in return for Shannon's safety. That is um, definitely a theory that holds a lot of uh, weight at this point in the story, um, and you're not on like a dissimilar track from a lot of characters in that respect either, because, you know, there are a lot of people who say that. Uh, Rosa says it, a Ava says it in the first episode. Um, a lot of people that are sus of the, of the servants. Uh, so, fair enough. Uh, I think in terms of the stakes themselves, unless they are fired from a weapon, only a few people on the island can stab them as deep as they are in the murders. I see. And, and yeah, that that is an interesting thought because they do specify a lot of the time how deeply embedded the stakes are. That's true. Uh, can you tell us about the plan you talked for episode three that you talked about? I will I will get to that in just a moment. Um, I feel like in the end the magic won't exactly be real, but won't exactly be not real. If it's real, it would undermine the mystery. But if it's not, it might be like those. It was all just a dream. Perhaps. Uh, good night, ERA. Hope you have a good time at work. Or I, I hope your work isn't too harrowing, <laughs> perhaps. Um, well, when will all the morphogenic fields and the talking mono-colored bear come into play? Oh boy, you're thinking of the wrong game. <laughs> uh, Let's see. Beatrice is Kinzo's dead wife. She's doing the killing as a ghost. Well, we know who Kinzo's wife was. Well, I mean, wife. I, I say know who Kinzo's wife is. We know that she exists. Um, but Genji said back in episode one that Beatrice was not Kinzo's wife. Remember that. Sorry if you're hearing weird tapping sounds. It's a pen that I'm stemming with. <laughs> uh, There's also a theoretical rebound, which would need such extreme precision to not embed in the wall or anything of the sort, not even thinking about actually hitting the target. Yeah. It would be hard. Lambda was definitely talking to Battler, who was huddled up in the corner, pissing himself after the end of chapter two. She told him about Beato torturing Rosa, then we see him interrupt Beato and Rosa. Yeah, I think, like, that one's kind of a given honestly in some ways like it is still left a little bit ambiguous but like i think for the most part you can definitely interpret that that's battler um unrelated but have you read the house in fata morgana i own it i have not read it i know i should because i know that i'll probably really like it uh Let's see. What if we never find out if it's magic and it's up for us to decide if the want to believe in the world of fact or a world of fantasy? Perhaps. How well would Battler survive in one of the Danganronpa games? I actually think Battler would probably do a pretty good job. Uh, he would he would be wilding, but I think he would uh, probably be like in protagonist mode. I think the Danganronpa mysteries are far more on his level. <laughs> Just remember to take the red truths with a grain of salt, thinking of them not as traps to restrict you, but struggling against them can loosen the slack and get you to progress. Yeah, like, the thing about the red truths is, like, they are true, but they can be intentionally worded in, like, an evasive way or whatever. Like, you, you do have to keep that in mind. Her name was Dead Wife Ushirami. <laughs> really hope Maria is not the culprit. Evil children is one of my least favorite tropes. Uh, yeah, I would. I, I would say, don't worry about that one too much. We've already talked about why it would be unlikely for Maria to be the culprit anyway. <clears throat> uh. 
Maybe the real magic was magic. That's magic. Yeah. Does this game take inspo from Raging Loop? I don't know. I don't know anything about Raging Loop. When did it come out? Oh, well, Raging Loop came out in 2015, so probably not. Because Umineko Episode 1 came out in 2007. So it was quite a while beforehand. So maybe Raging Loop takes uh, inspiration from Umineko or something. Well, I, I wouldn't know. I've never played it. <laughs> Of <laughs> this game was inspired by Ace Attorney, though. That's true. Ryukishi said that he was on a big Ace Attorney kick when he started Umineko, and that is part of why Battler looks the way that he does. And why he points. Kind of an unrelated question, but what is the best way to experience Higurashi? The best way to experience Higurashi, in my opinion, is just the original visual novel. Um, now, visually... Uh, I will tell you one of two ways. Uh, you can either play it with the Manga Gamer release that's on Steam, and if you do, without modifying it at all, then just use the original sprites. They're a little dopey looking, they're very amateur, but they've got charm, and they look way better than the Manga Gamer sprites. Uh, if you want something a little bit better and has like voice acting and stuff, then use 07th Mod, look up 07th Mod. They have a very handy dandy, handy dandy installer for the Steam versions of Higurashi where you can uh, put in the uh, alchemist sprites and voice acting and stuff. So, there you go. The, that's true though, Cyan Lime, uh, the, the manga is also pretty good. And the anime, it, yeah, I would say the anime is very like, very acceptable. Uh, it's like, okay, it got me into the series, but once I read the visual novel, there was no going back. Does uh, Higurashi also have multiple sprites? Yes. Does this game have multiple endings or is it linear or can that not be exposed? I, I decline to answer that question. Have I ever played Guilty Gear? I own one of the Guilty Gear games. Uh, I have not played much Guilty Gear though. I just checked out the Higurashi Steam page and the OG sprites are so baller. Peak art, why didn't anyone try to take new, try to make new ones? Fair enough. Any opinions on old Higurashi anime versus new Higurashi anime? Um. I can't really get into it too much, honestly. I think the original anime adaptation of Higurashi is like charming and I hold a soft spot for it, but it's like, again, once you read the VN, it's like, eh. The newer anime is a, it's a sequel. <laughs> so yeah, I, I can't really judge it in comparison. Um, and also, uh, again, I won't get into it too much, but uh, as for that anime, I like a lot of its ideas, uh, but its execution leaves me wanting quite a bit. Um, bu -bu -bu. I thought I had while reading through this chapter was that it's kind of interesting that to trust the Red Truths, we wind up believing in the Witch by Osmosis. I doubt there's any outright lies still. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic that, like, you do have to place a certain amount of trust in Beatrice's word, even though she is literally telling you to your face that she is trying to convince you of something that you don't want to believe. I think it's an interesting push and pull.
you have any thoughts on the Umineko manga you could share here? Uh, sort of, but I should probably refrain from getting too into it to not, like, spoil anything. My overall thoughts on the Umineko manga, I think they're, it's really good. I think a lot of the added scenes are very impactful and great, and, the mo like, the manga's art throughout the whole thing is, like, fucking fantastic. It's really, really good. I'm a little bit mixed on some of the things that it actually depicts, like, fully as compared to the VN, because there are a few things I will just say now that, like, the VN remains a little ambiguous about some aspects of the story, that the manga just, like, full is like, all right, here it is. Here's the answer to this stuff that we left a little bit more ambiguous in the original story. And, uh... I'm a little mixed on it, not because I think that the answers are bad, but because I think the very nature of depicting them so upfront is a little bit like, I don't know, I, I, I have mixed feelings about that decision. Um, and I can't really say why until we get like way further into the story. Um, but yeah. <laughs> I still I still really like the manga though. Uh, is the manga written by Ryukishi because the elaborating on things that weren't in the VN is questionable canon if not? Uh, no, it, yeah, this this is a thing that I should clarify. The manga version was made with heavy um, advisement from Ryukishi. Like, Ryukishi was in talks with the manga artist that was depicting the end of the manga. As far as the stuff that is shown that isn't in the original VN, he's the one that told the artist about it. He said that, like, that artist in particular is the person in the world that knows the most about the truth of Umi and Echo's story aside from him. Like, he gave it his full blessing. They are explicitly canon, yes. <clears throat> um, okay. Well, it seems that the theories are tapering off a little bit. Uh, unless anybody has any last minute objections, any things they want to throw into the fire real quick before we head off, just let me know. And then, if not, then I will tell everybody what my plan for next stream is. Repetition requested same time next week. I decline. Sorry. Uh, I will get to that in a moment. Theory, Umineko is a banger. True! Umineko is a banger. That's absolutely true. Uh... Okay. Yeah. Uh, June Pop 45 with the $5. Red Truth without love, you cannot see it. Without love, it cannot be seen. I will restate it. <laughs> Brain hurt, help me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm a few hours into episode three. I'm convinced that any scene without Battler there in universe is like pure Denpa and not much can properly be taken away from them besides that, oh, this person died. I would disagree with that. I would actually highly disagree with that. Um, I'm not going to get into why too deeply. But I still think that even if you don't believe in the literal uh, events that are taking place in front of your eyes, I do believe that the emotional truth of all of those scenes is still very important. Uh, that's just my takeaway, though. <clears throat> Okay, well, um, yeah, sorry to, to cut anybody off if, uh, if you have any other, uh, theories or whatever, but we're gonna, we're gonna cut it off here, and I'm going to tell you about, uh, what my plan is going forward. So, next week, there will not be, uh, an Umi, Umi Neko stream next week. I'm taking a break. Um, I am hoping to possibly return with episode three the next week, but we will see how it goes. 
Now, as for next week, however, that does not mean that there will be no stream next week. It just won't be an Umineko stream. On Saturday, the 16th, I am planning to do a stream sometime earlier in the afternoon-ish. It will be a much more casual stream. Uh, it will be, you know, very laid back. We will be playing a fun game that has no narrative to speak of. And we will have a special guest on the stream. Maybe somebody that some of you know about. Maybe somebody that some of you have watched videos from. Who knows? But, uh, that being said, this is the end of episode two, the end of the stream, next week's special guest stream, and the week after that, maybe, hopefully, episode three. So enjoy the break, enjoy the laid back stream when that happens, and uh, take easy, everybody. Thank you for joining me on this journey once again. Curie MatPat signing off, and me signing off as well. See you later.